The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is sponsored by Two Fat Lardies, Geek Nation Tours, and by the generous donations of you, the listener. Thank you to everyone for your support. We really appreciate it. Meeples and Miniatures, episode 243. Lucid Eye Publications. With hosts Neil Shook, Mike Hobbs, and Mike Whittaker, and guest Joe Seller from Lucid Eye Publications. This show was recorded on the 28th of February, 2018. Greetings one and all, and welcome to another episode of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. My name's Neil Shuck, and as always, I am joined by my faithful companions. First, we have the Welsh wizard himself. It is, of course, Mr. Michael Hobbs. How are you, sir? Hello, Neil. Hello, Meeps. Ah, I'm, I'm very well. Yes, very, very, very well indeed. Enjoying the basking sunshine that we have here in Wales. I saw the pictures. It was snowing. Yes, Baltic up here, mate. <laughs> we haven't had a lot of snow in 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 Leicester, but it's been blooming cold. Oh, yeah. and of so, course, and, and, and of course, we have the bard of the party. Why did this not strike me until just now that we have an adventurer party? I've just got to decide what I am. <laughs> You're the dwarf. Of course, yes. <laughs> yes, the... What am I? What am I? Oh, yeah, wizard. <laughs> <laughs> which, gets you, which gets you the fa- the famous line, for those who remember TSR's Imagine, I'm no mapping, it's boring, and anyway, I can't spell. <laughs> that was a lovely Welsh accent. <laughs> it wasn't Welsh. <laughs> it wasn't Scottish. <laughs> Why are dwarves Scottish? Why do people... I don't know, it does appear to be a common trope. It does, it does it? appear to be a common trope that, that dwarves appear to be Scottish, even even down to the point that John John Rhys Davis did Gimli with a dwarf. <laughs> who is Welsh? Who is Welsh? Did, did, did Gimli with a Scottish accent. What is going on? Anyway, yeah, yes, of course, of course, I am the dwarf. Yes, uh, yes, yes, the dwarf with um, well, what appears to be an allergy to opening doors. Yes, welcome to the party bard. It is, of course, Mr. Michael Whittaker. <laughs> I've been barred from more parties. Hello, mate. How are you doing? Greetings, all. I'm all right, if a bit cold. Uh, indeed. How has this not occurred to me before? We're an adventuring party. Is, is it... What does that make, Luffy? <laughs> Answers on a postcard to <laughs> the great Guru Luff. <laughs> well, well, it's obvious he's the party cleric. Party cleric? He's, he's never bloody here. <laughs> he's starting his own blooming religion, for crying out loud. <laughs> and he does like hitting things with blunt objects as well. Uh, uh, oh, indeed. Well, yeah, yeah I, I rest my cup. Yeah. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, right, okay. Well, there we are. Uh, the Meeple's Adventuring Party. Uh, yes. Mm. We clearly need to play Dungeon Circuit together. It's only taken us 243 episodes to come up with that. Never mind. Well, well, well welcome one and all. Uh, and joining us on our, our yes on our merry uh, on our merry Dungeon Quest this week. This week we have an uh, interview revisited that we haven't had before. Uh, oh, that one. That one, yes, uh, Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey. Basically, uh, th- we re-recorded an interview that we originally recorded three weeks ago, which was uh, which was meant to be episode two four two, except for technical faults, which which is why two four two was delayed while we actually had to record another interview with somebody else. 
However, uh, normal service has been vaguely, re- well, yeah, whatever normal is. Anyway, before we go too far into the episode, could, could I do a little quick uh, shout out? Certainly you can. Shout away. So, I'd like to say hi to Mr. Deacon, who's been poorly recently. Poor little aide, hasn't been well, and he had to go in and have a little operation. Little? <laughs> and they... <laughs> Don't milk it too much, you'll, you'll, you'll know what he's like. So, Aid, I'm really glad you got over the operation and you're on the mend, and I'm looking forward to seeing you um, ten, 10 days ago when this comes out in four days' time, perhaps, if the snow keeps off. Because I'm going to go up to Evesham and I'm going to see Aid and Jim and, and Mr. Clark's coming over and we might go and have a curry. Oh dear! <laughs> I, will, I will see a yes a secret uh, a secret planning meeting for um, uh, for Scourge of the Crankies. That's the one, yeah. But unfortunately, Aid can't come for the curry because he's not very well. <laughs> That's a shame, but. I'd like to <laughs> No, seriously, Aid. Uh, yeah, um, uh, I hope the, uh, the the convalescence goes well, mate. Uh, glad to hear that the op- uh, glad to hear the operation went well. And uh, yeah, uh, be well, be safe. And uh, where's my copy of Soul Wars Legions? That's true. And Aid, whatever you do, don't die in the next ten days. I was going to completely wreck this opening se- section. Well, that's sobering. No yeah. taste, taste, Mr. Deacon. You are not allowed to die. <laughs> who, who, said, who said we were lacking in taste and tact? <laughs> I don't know what you mean. Yeah, and uh, in that case, then what we'll do, we'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to catch up with what we've been up to over the last few weeks. <laughs> I must get through to Sergeant Watson's position. Jenkins, cover me! Sergeant Watson, bring your men in! Withdraw! It's all right, sir. We're enjoying ourselves. What? Yes, sir. It's these here chain of command rules, sir. We're having great fun. Chain of command? That's right, sir. It's a challenging but fun blend of command and control. It gives me the freedom I want to fight the way I want to. Never had so much fun, sir. But we've cooked you some sausages. Can't be helped, sir. Me and the lads are staying put. Chain of command, World War II, platoon level rules from two fat lardies. They really put you in control. And they're even better than sausages. What have we been playing? What have we been buying? We might even have painted something. The Meeples and Miniatures crew reveal all. It is that time of the show where we get to chat uh, all about what we've been up to. Well, since since we were last together, it's it, which in a wibbly wobbly timey wimey sense has been uh, a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks or so. So first off, tell you what. What we've we been playing, Mister Hobbs. What have you been up to? Oh, hang on a second. What what was that? Are you nicking ideas off Turk the Dice? Yeah. What? 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 You idiots? <laughs> that's a that sound effect, isn't it? That's not you rolling dice. No, no, that is a sound effect. Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's like when you roll limp. Yeah, because when you roll dice, they go off the table. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's like it, it goes like it's like. Good dunk. Good dunk. Oh. <laughs> it's a six, honest. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what have we been playing, is it? What have we been playing? What well, 
uh, not well, a bit. Um, I've had a few trips down to the war game in capital of Wales uh, to see Mark. Mm-hmm. And we've been playing Arkham Horror and Lord of the Rings card games. Oh, right. Okay, cool. And we've also played a few games of uh, Mythic Pantheon. Mythic Battle of Pantheon. Battles of the oh. Mythic in the Pantheon nature. Which is, is a very thing? good... Which is which is a great, fun, good game. There's no um, need to rub it in. Oh, what um, a game! Have you been play? Uh, have you just kind of been playing through the scenarios? Yeah, we just started with the basic ones. We haven't we haven't done any, um, you know, um, drawing or whatever you call it, and yeah. things. That's far too advanced. We've just been playing through the scenarios, and yeah, I, I I love the dice mechanic. The whole combat dice mechanic really makes you think. Yeah, it's pop, no, pop yeah. higher maths. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is really cool, isn't it? It, and, uh, and 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 yeah, just just some of the just some of the scenarios. I mean, even that mm. first one where you've got okay, you've got two gods against one. Hang on, how is this fair? <laughs> yeah. I, I did do a really good one. Uh, Mark wasn't happy because I, I we, we played it twice. So the second time, I played the two gods. So yeah. the two gods can't absorb the omphalas, the omphalumpas. So I sent... Um, I, I was wondering how long before I saw what to call them, those. <laughs> yeah. For me, in my 30 seconds. Yes. The gods have to absorb the omphalumpa. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Mark are very upset when I sent Hades up, who grabbed an omphalumpa, an omphala, and then ran as far away as possible and hid behind a rock. That's not very heroic. <laughs> It worked. <laughs> <laughs> then she's just got beaten to death by Ares. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah Ares, Ares is a monster, isn't he? He's a real, he's a real hard nut. You put yeah. Ares and a, you put Ares and Achilles together and ouch, they hurt. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Very, very, but great fun. Um, yeah. And I also travelled to um, valleys far and wide. I went to the Ronva Valley. I had to cross a mountain. And I went to the, the Sparrow's Nest, as we called it. Well, come on, this is Wales. It's not a very big mountain. You I shut mean... your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, yeah, I'm just thinking in the grand in the grand scheme of things. I mean, as far as like, the UK is concerned, yeah, it's sizable. But you know, yeah, compared it to like, I don't know, like, like Colorado, and um... <laughs> I'm just so, to be, to be coming around here in the Regals, mate. You know. Anyway, sorry, the Sparrow's Nest. Yeah. The Sparrow's Nest, yeah. I went to see Jeff. And I had a game with Jeff, Jeff and Jeff. No, wrong Jeff. <laughs> so the um, the two Jeffs and me, we had a game of um, Chain of Command in the Sparrow's Nest. And it was a buffet. And it was very nice. I'm going to go again. What, just for the buffet? Just for the buffet, yeah. <laughs> cool. But yeah, we had a really good, fun game. So, that's- yeah, and that's, that's it, that's what I've been playing. Cool. That sounds like me going up to. Uh, that sounds like me going up to uh, to see Colin and uh, and having uh, 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 and having uh, beef butties. Mm. Oh, sounds good. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, it was pulled beef. Was, oh, that was so good. Oh. Anyway. Yeah. Yes. So. <clears throat> oh, oh, cool. Okay. And uh, Arkham Horror. Um, have you kind of uh, completely failed the scenario yet? Uh, yeah, we've com- we've completely failed uh, the third scenario from from the core game. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that was tough. Yeah, that gets quite nasty, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. We, we we died horribly. Yeah. But so, but I yeah. but, but I do like how that narrative just keeps going. It's re- it's, it's, it's really clever. really clever. Yeah, such a such a clever game. So yeah, five good games, which is which is not bad for a month. Excellent. So, who's next? Uh, uh, shall I go next? Okay. Uh, right. Okay. So what have I, what have I played since we last time? Uh, right. Okay. I had a game of Conan. Did I mention last time that I suddenly realised I've been playing Conan completely wrong as the Overlord? Uh, yeah, you were playing monsters once and then taking the card. No, out. I, I, no, I was playing the the, the yeah the 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 raven the 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 raven tile. Oh, the raven! Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was for some reason I, I decided that you, that I could only ever play it once. 
No. Yeah. He, well, yeah. Well. Yeah. 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 Basically. Oh, um, being able to have uh, multiple reinforcements makes playing the Overlord so much better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes us. It makes. Uh, it, make, uh, uh, yeah, it makes. It makes the scenarios so much harder. <laughs> Uh, why? Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure exactly how I got that wrong, but there we go. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, had a, um, had one Gary Conan, and, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I enjoyed it all. Not quite sure about my uh, uh, my fellow adventurers, but I enjoyed it all. Uh, then we did a blast from the past. I found myself with my other mate Dave uh, looking for a two player game, and uh, we've been chatting about oh, uh, something to. Uh, uh, what he'd like to play, and so we had a few games of Memoir Forty Four. I got my copy of Memoir Forty Four out of the um, um, off the shelf, and uh, he's really enjoying it. Okay, this is the you know it's it's uh, obviously one would argue it's a uh, it's a slightly simpler version of CNC Ancients or CNC Napoleonics, uh, and f- uh, from my point of view, it's like you know. We've got other World War Two games that scratch that itch, but uh, which is why I haven't played it a lot. But actually, for what it is, it's a really good little game. I must be. I haven't played it. Nice to get it back to the side. It, it, it's a bit different. It, it's certainly, it's certainly one of the one of the simpler implementations. Although, considering the amount of compl- complications they've added with all the expansions. But mm. I mean, uh, we've got it up. Uh, I've got it up until the air pack, uh, which is like the first five expansions. So it's like yeah, the terrain expansion, and then Russia, Brits, and Pacific War. Uh, so you know, uh, it's before it got really, really complicated with all the extra different units that they started adding in. Uh, mm. And uh, from that side of things, yeah, it's yeah, decent game. Yeah, quite impressed with that. Is it uh, worth getting? You know, because considering the amount of World War Two games I got, and you know, and I got a metric shed load of he was a Normandy. I would, I would suggest not. Uh, and I, actually, I mean, funnily enough, I, I'm actually looking potentially to. Uh, uh, I'm wondering if my mate Dave will uh, will eventually succumb <laughs> and buy my copy of Memoir Forty Four off me. Uh, <laughs> there's actually a very compelling reason not to buy it. Okay. You can play it online. Oh, you can, can you? Yes. Yes, oh. you can. Which which gets around such tedious little problems as the fact that two of the expansions are yeah. out of print. <laughs> that's, that's a very well, good point well made. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and, and actually, the, the online implementation is actually very good. Oh, uh, man, look at that. So, uh, so that is worth having a look, but yeah, um, I, it wouldn't be on the top of my shopping list certainly. And I think there are there are other World War Two game uh, board games that do it better. I think, uh, I think your uh, yeah, if you've got Heroes of Normandy, which obviously you have, then uh, yeah, it basically scratches the same bitch, mate. So I I, I I wouldn't worry about that. We played uh, Lords of Waterdeep, uh, but we played it with the Scoundrels of Schoolport expansion. Which uh, puts uh, several new areas into play, and some new mechanics, and several new sets of cards. Interestingly, because I mean, Luffy always said that the problem with Lords of Waterdeep was that it's a it's a great game, but it isn't long enough. Well, actually, putting the the Scandal of School for expansion adds lots of extra bits and pieces to it. Lengthens the game a bit, so I think it basically adds about an extra another half an hour onto the game. I would suggest because it gives everybody uh, a, 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 an extra an extra worker placement every every turn. But for an expansion that makes a game longer, it doesn't outstay its welcome. And I would suggest that Lords of Waterdeep with Scoundrels of Schoolport is better than Lords of Waterdeep without it. Hmm. Is that the game where you're sort of playing the NPCs from D and D? Is that the one? Yeah, where you're trying yeah. to recruit parties and things. That's the one. It's a worker placement yeah. game, and actually, what you're doing, yes, you are the guy that's attempting to recruit the parties, uh, right? To to go and fulfil all, all the quests. Uh, it is one of the best worker placement games I've played. It is. It's it's really cracking game. 
so uh so we did that we did uh oh quick <laughs> obviously do you remember last year at the uk games expo mm, when yes. late in the day it got to a point that all we all we had to do was point at a game and mr hitman would buy it yeah yeah that was great fun <laughs> oh dave that's supposed to be good <laughs> That's got potential. <laughs> anyway, uh, one of the games he bought uh, games at the Games Expo last year, because and that, that was one of these things that I, I, I just happened to be, oh, yeah, that's meant to be good. The next thing I knew, he bought it. Uh, Dungeon Lords. And we, we, actually, we actually got to play that last week. Uh, Dungeon Lords, it's, uh, uh, and again, it's one of these things of actually what, what you do, uh, it's a competitive game. Uh, each of you is the lord of your own little dungeon. And you're basically build, basically building your dungeon, creating traps, um, recruiting monsters, and at some point uh, your dungeon is going to get invaded by adventurers. And the idea is is, is hopefully to uh, to uh, defeat the adventurers before they wreck your dungeon. It's 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 a it, it, it's a fun little game. It's, it's one of these games that uh, there's an awful lot of rules which actually once you've read through them you kind of go. Oh right, that's what it means. You know, yeah, you know, the, you know, the the volume of rules doesn't seem to fit the complexity of the game. If you know what I mean, yeah, that was that was a fun little game. So play play with that. Yeah, it, it essentially it's it's a it's a board game take on the Dungeon Siege. Yes, game. yeah, it, yes, it is something like that. Uh, with the disadvantage that you don't get to beat up chickens, which apparently is the the most fun you can have in Dungeon Siege. <laughs> No, I, I can confirm there are definitely no chickens in Dungeon Lords. I do like the idea of um, hiring your monsters. Like, oh yes, hello. Uh, we, we do have a vacancy for Troll on level three. If you'd like to go and see Miss Marple in recruiting, she'll sort you out with, with a name badge. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is it. You're going to do that with like vampires, witches, yes. dragons. <laughs> But then, at some point, at some point after recruiting them, after after recruiting them, you've got to pay them. And if you don't get your resource resources just right, you recruit them just to kind of see them. And go, hang on, I say just, just before the adventurers arrive, they're going to go. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Before these adventurers arrive at the door, uh, yeah, I want to get paid again. I was like, what do you mean you want well, more food? <laughs> well, the vampires go on strike. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, especially like, ah, I, ah, I built my cutting dungeon, and I haven't got enough. I haven't got enough resources to retain all my monsters, so they all leave. <laughs> no. Yes, before any listeners write in, I am of course talking complete wombats. It's dungeon keeper, not dungeon siege. Dungeon keeper. Huh. Ah. Oh yeah. Uh, which was which was basically a a dungeon management game. Where you do exactly that, heroes turn up and you have to fight ah, them off. Cool. And then we had a uh, yes, and then other than that, we had a game of I had a game of Battle of Britain with Mister Luff, completely wobbly planes, but he did enjoy it. Then we uh, we, we got in a, a play of a second play of Legends of the Alliance, Imperial Assault, the, you know the app for Imperial Assault. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, that's that is really good actually. Really, we really enjoyed that. I was going to ask how you'd found that because it's it's on my list. Excellent. To try. It seems to give a slightly different feel to the game than as if than if you're playing against uh, against somebody. You know when the guys are although you're you're still completing missions. If you're playing against somebody who's playing the imperial player, it has a feel of a skirmish game. Yeah. When it seems that you're playing, when it seems that yeah. you're playing all three of you against the app, it feels more like an adventure. I don't know why, but it it, it feels more like you're playing an adventure. Which, which face it, unless you're actually you actually bought um, Imperial Assault to be the skirmish game, which is a completely different game fundamentally, yes. is what you're looking uh, for. Yes, and uh, and that's what that's what we found. Uh, so so we had, we had an absolute scream. We we kind of settled down on there is one question around because it doesn't track movement of uh, of where people of exactly where people are after they deploy. 
obviously that's done with the the pieces on the board. The movement rules take a bit of getting your head around because basically, you know, you've got okay, right, well, this piece now is now activated and it will do this, 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 or this, depending on what its best option is. That takes a bit of getting your head around. But once you get once you get into the swing of things, it's actually quite straightforward. It's it, it, it's 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 just a case of being procedural, you know, and being logical. It's no worse than the the imaginary overlord in uh, invisible overlord in um, in dungeon Saga, surely. No, no. So uh, that's it. And uh, uh, but ha- but again, the the uh the thing that won playing experience of the month so far was a game of mansions of madness that we played a couple of weeks ago i won't do many spoiler alerts other than the fact to say that okay first off the scenario takes place in dunwich so anybody who knows their lovecraft will kind of know a little bit about what's coming up the only other thing that uh, one thing that made it memorable is that it's the first time uh, uh, we actually ran out of fire tokens. <laughs> the entire board was on fire. <laughs> buildings, Oops. buildings, hilltop, everything. The entire board was ablaze. Uh, <laughs> And especially when you got a point where some where somebody's attempting to sometimes somebody's attempting to to stop a ritual taking place, which is kind of the you know, standard fare for Call of Cthulhu on top of a hilltop. Meanwhile, somebody's so somebody's busy running around the bottom of the hilltop, constantly putting the fire out. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh dear. It, yes. Uh, uh, it, yes. It was. It was memorable. It's a very good scenario. The, the, I think it's a scenario five. I think it is. Uh, yeah. It's. Uh, but it's yes. But yes. It's. It's the one that takes place in Dunwich. Uh, it's good. Uh, so yeah, l- lots and lots and lots of stuff played. Haven't had a bad game, which is good stuff. That's me. So, Mister Whitaker, what have you been playing? What have I been playing? Well, um, I think last time we spoke, I just ra- either was was in the process of running or had just written up a um, I ain't been shot one scenario for the campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the British were attempting to cut off a German withdrawal and sort of partially succeeded. Um, they 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 did get to do something, did get rid of one of the stugs, which has been annoying them for about four 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 scenarios. Um, they they they're really not very fond of stugs. I don't think it's the low profile that makes them hard to hit, and the habit of popping out from hedges and making large holes in Germans that I think really really gets them a little fed up. Um, so that was fun. Um, I'm in the process of writing the next one, which is this week. Uh, also, what have we had? We've had uh, last games in the in our little open combat board Reavers campaign, which um, I didn't win. It was which was great fun. I still love it as a as a skirmish game. Uh, we've had the second to last game of our Dival Rampant. Uh, what's the word? Um, game of Thrones campaign. That seems to have flown by. The variant. Ooh. Yeah, it's been going. This is, this is this is game five. What, you're only doing like six games? It's six games and a big all day in okay. April. Oh, cool. Uh, in which is going to fundamentally be you 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 will decide which uh, which faction for king you want to support as a result of all the goings on. And and I think the night the night to, 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 the, for that game I think the Night's Watch will be playing the role of Lord Stanley, <laughs> finding a convenient hill to sit on while we decide which side we want to pick on. Sounds fair. <laughs> Sounds fair. Yes. Um, had my first game of Ooh. Gaslands. Yeah. What do you think of it? My goodness, that's a fun game. Hats off to Mr. Hutchison. That is a cracking little game. Nice to see you now actually played it, considering it was your number three game of last year. Yeah, and and you can see why. And can see why. <laughs> okay, I, I don't count moving around half a dozen half a dozen toy cars on the kitchen table and testing out the rules as a proper play. But it was clear from that it was going to be awesome, and it's even more awesome with with multiple players and. 
fun was had. Um, considerable amounts of fun were had, actually. It was, a re- it was a really good little game. What have you done as far as tracks are concerned? How have you built your track? Uh, so for the game at the club, we, we basically dug out a few random bits of... Uh, Slightly of, of of fantasy stroke poker post post apocalyptic scenery and stuck them on a deep cut mat, but I'm in the process of when my 3D printer will actually behave itself, 3D printing some start and finish gates, which have actually come out quite well. Oh, cool! Um, STL files will probably be available on my website once they've actually got the kink signed out uh, and persuaded my printer that the filament would like to stick to its bed again because it seems to be going through one of those incredibly irritating phases where things don't stick for no obvious reason i thought it was just the abs but it seems to be doing it with pla which is my normal filament as well at the moment which is particularly annoying so i have a large backlog of things i want to print including some stuff to bring to hammerhead Do, does it sound like they're going to get to hammerhead yeah, it's not the present rate of progress not unless i can get things to stick to the bed tomorrow morning um, fun, funnily enough, I, yeah, I hate you. yeah, I have no problems getting things to stick to my bed. Not too high, normally. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> particularly me. <laughs> yeah, I was say, yeah, it's back trouble. I had problems getting it off the mattress. Yes. <laughs> so, so modulo modulo shows that's pretty much it. All right, okay, right, and uh, okay. So, what were you playing at the show? Let's bite the bullet, shall we? Well, you should know you were there. I was there. Didn't you play it, Neil? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Well, let, let, let's, yeah, we, we took the, the, the... Let's rewind, shall we? We, t- we took the, the, the Dead Army game, which I'm sure folks will have seen, because we've taken it to Salute and one of the Callum Hall shows, uh, and I think a couple of others, which is basically the hordes of the undead raised from the cemeteries of Warmington Parva by the Nazis, um, attempt to take on the lads from Dad's Army. It's the Dad's Army's finest moment. Uh, so, Neil, how many shows do you think we've been to together? Um, I can't. I can't rightfully count uh, more than uh, uh, more than a handful. <clears throat> My guess is about ten or twelve. Really? Uh, it's been four years. Okay. Um, of which I reckon we've probably brought. Half a dozen, eight games or so. How many of have you played? He doesn't like zombies, Mike. Obviously. How many of have you promised you'll come and play? Um, more than none. More, it's certainly more than none. And how many yeah. have you actually played? Um, I'm sure. I'm sure I've played something in the past. No, uh, not a thing. Really? Not ever. Not ever. No. Not a sausage. Not even after you've wandered up to me at the beginning of the show and said, that looks cool, I'll come back and have a game later. I couldn't get a game when we were at the Royal Armouries. The point where I, I had time to get a game uh, when you were doing the the scuba diving at Partizan, at that point you started to pack up. It just sounds like excuses to me. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, and as for this Dad's Army, as, as for this Dead's Army game, I mean, the thing was... I'd, I'd set my heart. I mean, you, you, before the show, you'd uh, you know you'd mapped out what you were doing in various other bits and pieces, and I'd set my heart on defending the Cricket Pavilion at all costs. Mi- oh come where, on! Where was the Cricket Pavilion, Mister Whitaker? On the kitchen table. <laughs> on the kitchen table. On the kitchen table. <laughs> yeah, pretty, a likely <laughs> excuse. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, I, I accuse you of letting the side down generally. J'accuse. You might be able to manage it at Hammerhead if you can find ten minutes. Do you think you can find ten minutes? Sir, so, well, I, I, I know one person who's definitely wants to play Dambuster's play, and I, and I quite fancy playing the, Dambu- the Dambuster thing. Now, hopefully, this time it will be behaving itself. Yeah, we fixed the bits that were um, <laughs> technically at fault. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was only the, the LEDs on the Lancaster. Yeah. Mental, note, mental note to self, must remember to charge Android tablet uh, before uh, Saturday. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, yes, I will put my hands up and say, uh, I, I mean, yeah, Mike sat, looked at me and went, uh, uh, do you want to play a game of Dead's Army? And it was only two o'clock. It was. That was the particularly hurtful thing. <laughs> 
And here's my excuse point. Uh, I'd only had three, hour, th- th- three hours sleep. I was absolutely naked. <laughs> For sure. And you, shunned, you shunned him, Neil. You shunned him. Yeah. I did. In my defence, I got home and then crashed out for four hours. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's what that's that's what that strange earthquake like rubbling noise was as Indeed, we drove home, yes. was it? Indeed. <laughs> yes. So much so that I missed church, despite the fact I was meant to be leading worship. Oops, never mind. <laughs> Oops. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, okay. Right. So uh, Ooh, that's a bit yes, so well, see, if you'd if you'd stayed and played a game, you'd have had to go straight to church, so you wouldn't have missed it. Uh, indeed. Would you? Guilty as charged, my lord. Tusk, tusk, tusk. So, yes, as you may have gathered from that conversation, we, as it's the 75th anniversary of the Dembusters raid this year, we are taking the good old Dembusters game to... Um, Hammerhead. Uh, Which would have Hammerhead. happened, possibly. Yes. In fact, it may well be the case that by the time you hear that you are listening to this, we will have taken the good old yes. Dembusters game to Hammerhead. And the old still would have played it. Oh, ye, oh, ye of little fight. Yes. You'll blame this now. Yeah, well, we'll see. Shall Tune we? in next time. Yes. Yes. I don't know if you've played little fight, actually. Well, tomorrow's and Thursday's job is getting the thing out of the back of the storeroom. Uh, which hopefully means that before before there's so much snow, I can't. It's because this is all entirely dependent on, on someone remembering to reopen the A1. Really? Oh, okay. Fine. Which was closed for most of today, apparently. It depends on what two inches of snow will do. Yeah, close from Peterborough to, nearly to Stamford. Indeed. Anyway, shall we shall we move on? Yes. What's next? What are we moving on to? It's an aerosol can of paint. Indeed, it is. What what have we been painting, Japs? <laughs> good, good. What a pathetic sound effect. It's the best I could do at short notice. What have we become? <laughs> that, that yeah. by the way, was a fairly desperate guess. I wasn't expecting to be right. <laughs> well, put it, this, put it this way. I was thinking the sound effect of a paintbrush brushing paint onto something would probably not be particularly impressive. Not that that's any much better, but there you go. No, that, that is actually pretty Indeed. dismal. I'll go first, shall I, and just say, other than, uh, well, since last we spoke, I haven't actually managed to get anything finished. Uh, I am halfway through um, 17 Ronin, which have been stored on my paint desk for about th- for at least a couple of weeks, but I've not actually painted anything. So uh, so abject failure on my part. Mr. Whitaker, then, what have you, you been painting? What have I been painting? <laughs> um, I painted a cricket pavilion and left it on the kitchen table. What, what colour did you paint him? Like it? Uh, white, white, apart from the bits which are green, and the roof which is felt. Felt. It did actually involve more. Yeah, well, it's the the wall base is worn and has a flat roof, so I figured the best thing to do was to paint it a sort of a sort of um, field grey felty kind of colour, so it looked like it was felt. I mean, did you actually kind of texture it, or did you just paint it that colour? I just painted it that colour. It may get a bit of tarting up before uh, before its next outing, but it doesn't look that bad. All things considered. Other than that, I think that's pretty much it, to be honest. No, I can't think, I don't think. No, that's it. That's your lot. Right. Completely uneventful. Mr. Hobbs, could please come and save the day. I've been painting the elves. Fa- Neil. I was like, elves, fa- <clears throat> thousands of them, Sarge. Thousands of them. <laughs> About 50 of them. <laughs> I'm still going strong though, so I've um, nearly finished my second age elves for my Lord of the Rings mm-hmm. stuff, and I've done. I need to turn around. This is the sound of me turning around, and I painted um, Elrond's two two twins who I can't remember their names of, and a Gorfindel, who's my favourite elf ever, and a couple of uh, a captain and a what as in. What is in your favourite elf, elf from literature, as opposed to the yeah favourite elf from, from uh, Tolkien? Yes, because he was a badass. It was a it was an old Gorfindel, killed a Balrog, came back from the dead. Can't you can't beat that? Mm. Yeah, there there is of course that great debate in Tolkien fandom about whether they're the same elf Gorfindel or just two guys with different names. Yeah, two guys, two different guys with the same name. Yeah, we couldn't. I think it's in one of the um, one of the appendixes we. Where he does say 
elf names were all unique, and he, he brought them back by he was brought back by the Maya. Ah, oh, he right. Brought back in power. Is it which case, yeah. yeah. Glorfindel kick serious yeah. butt. Yeah, so he came back, and yeah, he, I mean, just in 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 Lord of the Rings, I mean, he he went up against the Ring Wraiths on on the bridge, you know, and hi, this is yeah. me. Yeah. Oh God, he's he's a proper proper old style he's elf. A serious yeah. So yeah, I painted up the um the armored version the Games Workshop was on that, and I've got the two other versions now on, on, on my paint desk. So, um, yeah, second second age elves are all done, near enough, apart from the last bits and bobs on the some some arches. Uh, and then I'm just about to start on the um, Gladrian elves, which is going to be on my, my main force. So, uh, oh, cool. I bought some Games Workshop plastic elves. Some of their which are absolutely fantastic sculpts. Oh, those are cavalry? Uh, I got the cavalry, which I haven't put together, but I got some of the infantry as well, because they just came back, and so I bought four boxes of those. Mm-hmm. And uh, oh, they're, they're gorgeous, really, really nice figures. Unfortunately, I also bought a command pack, which I found out is from Finecast. Oh, but you love Finecast so much. Steaming pile of... F- f- <laughs> Luckily, there's only four of them, so they can't upset me too much. <laughs> so yeah, doing those next. So I'll be playing around with um, different sh- different types of gold effect for the uh, the Gladrian yeah. ones. So uh, yeah, that's been fun. So yeah, lots of elves, lots of gold, lots of uh, lots of fun doing those. Cool. Right. Hmm. Break out the piggy bank. What have we been buying? You, you've really <laughs> got the town on the sound effects, haven't you? No, yeah. no expense spared. None at all. No expense spent, yeah. indeed. <laughs> I really hope our listeners are, are enjoying those sound effects as much as we are. I hope they're enjoying them considerably more, actually. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, okay. So, uh, yes, uh, obviously, we've heard that you've that you've been buying uh, Alvin cavalry and infantry, and you know you love fine cast so much that you bought some more. Uh, anything else you've been up to? I think it's Mike's turn to go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I had a bit of a shopping spree at uh, had the Baba Robin. Mm-hmm. Uh, bought a set or a pe- couple of uh, Flames of War Hurricanes, what? on the grounds that the Brits, the Brits in the Italian campaign, do need some ground support. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, and they're plastic, not resin, which means that the same thing will not happen to them as happened to the Spitfire I had before Christmas. Or well, melted? No, I spray spray painting it on the coat outside and dropped it on the concrete. <laughs> And uh, and it uh, and it exploded in the same way that the special effects in the film went. <laughs> yes. Pretty much, yes. It, it is. It was very definitely an X Spitfire. Make a nice objective marker. Uh, not that good. Um, the other thing is, I was passing the Sarissa stand, which was that, that's always dangerous, Mike. Well, so we picked up. They were selling off. Um, he says, throwing a bit on the floor. They were selling off some of their test makes when they when they first print a piece. They test it, they test assemble it, um, and they had, from what he was saying, he had basically he'd he'd, he'd set up the stall on the uh, Saturday, uh, driven home on the Sunday, and picked filled the van with test builds. So I picked up their twenty eight mil bandstand to go in the middle of the village green for the Dead's Army game Neil didn't play. Um, <laughs> and I was doing all right until I wandered by, I think it was Ainsty, I might be wrong, who'd also got a bunch of their 15s. It might not be been Ainsty. It was somebody opposite, across the way from Sarissa, and I picked up six Norman, 15 mil Normandy buildings for 20 quid. Already assembled. Ooh, that's good. Which are 
Well, they're Sarissa. You know, they've they've got they they do that nice thing with the Normandy buildings where the window for where everything is MDF except for the window frames and shutters, which are greyboard, uh, and they look really really good. So those are currently sitting there, waiting for a coat of paint. Um, I pledged for Annie's Kickstarter, but I think we've already covered that, haven't we? Yeah, I think that's about it, actually. Um. Don't recall anything else. Don't pledge for anything else. Hmm. Uh, we might have to look. We may have to go and look at my Kickstarter page and see if I've missed anything. <laughs> <laughs> Not that anybody else ever does this. Uh, me Kickstarter. No, Freya's Wrath. The Wrath does appear to have been the last thing I pledged for. Okay, cool. Mister Hobbs, do you wish me to go next, just so you don't sound so bad? Oh yeah, please, definitely. <laughs> now you said that. <laughs> You know, so I was being good at the start of the year, or trying to be good. It, it's yeah, it's it, it's all, it's it's all kind of falling apart a little bit. It all started. It all started fairly innocuously enough. As I say, we went to Robin, uh, and at Robin, I, uh, I I was very good at Robin. I uh, I, I bought f- uh, two. I bought yeah. I I basically bought f- uh, four gangs of Rome figures. I bought two ga- uh, two gang members and a couple of allies. Uh, and that was all I planned to 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 buy at Robin, and and that and that's what I bought. Good man, well done. However, since then it's all kind of gone, started to go downhill a little bit. Uh, it all started when uh, obviously uh, last time we talked about uh, mythic battles and the fact I was regretting buying the uh, terrain pack. And since then, especially since I'm not willing to pay, to pay the, the crazy the crazy eBay prices people want for them, I've been looking around for some alternatives to their pla- uh, to their cardboard trees. Uh, now I know there's you know I'll just use wargaming trees, but I just want to look for something different. And I actually found some really no- some really nice things. Uh, a company called Urban Construct, if you've come across them. Yeah, I know them. Uh, yeah, uh, they do a pack of tree stumps. Uh, yeah. re- resin tree stumps in 28 mil, which are great for kind. I mean, especially kind of considering you know. Uh, I mean, I mean the whole point with with the battles, it's kind of it's kind of post-apocalyptic Greece, and so thinking rather than having these full trees lying around, I think you'd have the kind of like these you know these charred tree stumps and stuff. So I bought a couple of packs of those, you know, uh, which is fine. Uh, and then I was looking at uh, what, the Warming States event is happening uh, on May the twenty fourth uh, at Warlord Games. Test of Honor Warming States event, and uh, sometime towards the end of last year, somehow foolishly, I promised Kieran that I do a terrain table. Um, and I recently changed my mind over what table I was going to do and so it, it was it was it actually it was probably after I'd seen that Sarissa had t- uh, uh, tweeted a picture of their forthcoming temple that they're doing uh, it's coming out in March or April and I went oh that's nice oh wouldn't it be really good if we um if I did a lot you know, did like a you know a little walled compound uh so um I've just uh, I've just spent uh, uh a few pounds Buying uh, lots of walls from um, from TT Combat, uh, sorry, troll, uh, sorry, troll trader, uh, to make uh, uh, to make that uh, to make that up, and bought a shrine and a couple of other bits and pieces. So I now have everything that I need uh, to to build this nice kind of walled compound for the warming states. Uh, I've just got three weeks to build it in and paint it all. Yeah, okay, that's gonna be fun. Well. If the worst comes to worst, you can always lend some of my Japanese terrain, which is all painted. I didn't know you had any terrain. Yeah, I got some of the um, Oshiro's um, Ooh, buildings. Oh, that's all they're nice. All they are nice. All, all painted, and um, there's a you know the the gatey body you know the Tommy Gate thing. Yeah, that's the yeah. one. Yeah, what it's called. Yeah. Hello to all our Japanese listeners, um, and fewer bits and bobs. So. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, I, yes it's, it's might involve an, uh, an emergency trip to Wales, depending how it goes over the next two weeks. Right, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, and then um, and then uh, I'm not quite sure exactly how I spotted it, but um, I suddenly I, I then discovered all of a sudden that uh, Magic Madhouse are having a sale 
and including it in that sale were uh, uh, this might still be on Mike uh, but included in all that stuff is that they were selling all their Rune Wars stuff for half price I moved on from Rune Wars mate that's yesterday's game <laughs> Just a nice game, indeed. Uh, so, so anyway, I um, I bought a couple of packs of uh, put, I bought a couple of packs of Rune Wars figures uh, last week, uh, simply because it was like they were half price, and I thought, oh yeah, I, I have one of those, and I have one of those. I, I didn't mean to, honest. And then, as if that wasn't enough, somebody, Michael and Joe, what are you doing to me? Uh, Michael and Joe love Joey. H- had a great chat with them. At- uh, Robin, and then they were saying, "Oh yeah, we're, uh, yeah, we're going to do, do another Kickstarter for uh, for bows and badges before it comes out in April because we because we want to release uh, uh, some more miniatures for that." And that launched uh, well uh, as we speak. That launched a couple of days ago, so I may have had a had a small accident on uh, the bows and badges Kickstarter. Yeah, it, it's 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 not going well, and Star Wars Legions is not the far away. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, mo- yeah. Moving on. Right. In my defence, can I say it's been about a month since I've been on here? <laughs> uh, so, so um, I've had to break these down into various, um, various sections. Okay, so things that arrived in the post that I wasn't expecting. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Um, I had the Conan Overlord book turn up. Oh, 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 oh I've forgotten yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, a book of set. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, my book of set turned up as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah go on. Sorry, go on. Which is, which is very nice. Nice. It's a nice scenario in that Overlord book. Um, <laughs> I was just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, the 18 plus one in the middle is just funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also had from um, Devil Pig Games a um, he was a Black Reach uh, a thing called Drop Zone turn up, which is like a starter scenario. Oh right, it's okay. Self contained, so it's got um, it's got like a fold out poster for the board. It's got two forces, forty k forces, uh, the rules, and some cards to actually play the game. So it's completely self-contained. I wasn't expecting that at all. Oh, cool. I had no idea no idea they were doing that. So that's survived. So that looks really nice. Okay. So that's that's the things that turned up which I wasn't expecting. Things that I wanted to buy and needed a, an excuse to buy. I got another um, optical power storage box. Oh, right. So this was, um, remember last, on the last time I was on, I, I was talking about the one I got for Acton, Acton, yes. uh, for Arkham Horror. Well, I, I got one for Lord of the Rings. Well, actually, my wife bought it for me for as, as a Valentine's present because she was so so impressed by the Arkham Horror one. She bought me a, a Lord of the Rings one. Oh wow! It, was it? Was, is it the same size as the, as the Arkham Horror one? Yeah, exactly the same size. It's just uh, it's engraved with a uh, really nice Lord of the Rings logo and rings on it and things. It looks really really cool. Um, I've got to say that. Optical power. I, this box cost me forty pounds. Actually, cost the wife forty pound, and it's gorgeous, handmade. And I found out they're in Wales, so they're actually made in in Carmarthen. So it's just down the road for me. So a big shout out to Op Op Power. I also managed to track down a copy of the uh, nineteen seventy nine Holmes edition of D and D Basic, which is the blue the book. The blue one. Oh, so. Th- that's the, the pre. That's the pre-red Classic. one. Yeah. Oh yeah. Red D and D red box. That's that's for you know. We don't talk about that. Everyone's into the Holmes edition. That's the proper, the proper edition. The blue book. And I got before the red book. Oh. Yeah. It came out after you had the very first edition, which was basically Gary Gygax's Scrawlings, which came out in a little box of um, three books. And then it were, they, they they did the Holmes edition of the basic rules, which came out at the same time as um, Advanced D&D. That's the one with the dragon on the cover, isn't it? That's the one, yeah. Yeah. The classic blue book. Well, it's, so, it's only blue because the door and the dragon's wings are blue. No, it's blue because it's all blue. <laughs> I can post you a picture if you want. <laughs> I mean, we might not be looking at the same one. The box art was colour, but the... 
Blue Book. I, yeah. I shall send you a picture, Mister Mister Whitaker. It is called the Blue Book because it's blue, um, and I got that for twenty pound on eBay. That's not a bad deal. That's, that's, I was watching it thinking. Oh right, that blue book. Yeah, yeah I know which one you mean now. Yeah, the basic basic D and D. Yeah, the the black and white version of the colour one. In fact, there is a colour version of the same picture. Yeah, the colour version is on the front cover of the box because it came in a box with. Uh, but the, yeah, but the book itself is actually blue and white, essentially, yeah, white. rather than black and white. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know yeah. the one you mean now. Yeah. So yeah, I got. Oh boy. Which I, I've had hours of fun just rereading that again, reminding myself when I was fifteen. You mean you you don't carry you don't carry a functional set of D and D in no, your head? We, we oh, moved seriously. on to request. I, I pretty much, I have run enough D and D that I could probably run you a st- a slightly bastardized hybrid of first and second edition yeah. without any rules. The thing is, we moved very quickly onto RuneQuest, so I, I can I can run RuneQuest quite easily. Yeah, I was never a D and D. I was always a D and D. So, um, so yeah, it was that. Um, now then, Pear Broden, Mr. Pear. Hi, Pear. Yeah, to whom I still, yeah. I still owe some 3D prints. <laughs> yeah. My printer will behave itself. <laughs> so, Sorry, Pear. I'm trying. Very. <laughs> so so Pear sent me, sent me a, um, a message saying that he's doing an order for um, for Eureka to pick up in at Salute. <laughs> and did I want anything? <laughs> oh, you fool. I think I know what's going on. <laughs> So I've um, I, I've moved up the um, the Hawkman figures from the ones I had. So I've now got enough with what I've ordered to give me a, a nice functional force for a nice fantasy game that's coming out um, anytime soon when I write it. But they've also got on their um, on the Eureka site the first of the ten mil Hawkman figures. Oh, I've not seen those. Ooh, oh, crikey! Oh, oh. Yes, they've done the the Wolf Clan in ten mil. <gasps> I'm thinking Sword and Spear Fantasy. Oh, it's, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thought you might be. Yeah. So I've, I've only ordered one pack of those. Just, just have a little look at them. So yeah, there's those. So thank you, Pear, for for that. But well, hopefully right. Nick might have a few more. Um, oh, I'm sure he'll have loads of salute, yeah. yeah, if you find him. All right. This next one was cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, lads. We've, we've almost finished. Right. I have to give a big shout out to Mr. Derek Hodge one of our listeners, and a damn fine fellow. He's a fine supporter of the mm. Lardies. He is that. He came up with this fantastic idea of using nail transfers. Oh, oh the, yes. yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mr. Hodge, I salute you. You are a genius, sir. Yes. I shall raise a dram in your uh, your honour. Yeah. So, I, I've been painting elves and I had to do an elf banner. And I thought, I'm not free hand in it. So I thought, oh, you know, Derek put this, like, this post out about using nail transfers. So I had a look on eBay, and I found some nail transfers of, um, like, Plum Blossom. Oh, right, yeah. Japanese Plum Blossom. And I thought, that's pretty cool for else. And yeah, it cost me um, the princely sum of 99p. <laughs> Eric was actually using them for gasland yeah, vehicles, yeah. which you can get things like checkerboards, and you can have, you, you can have fingernails with go-faster stripes, <laughs> effectively. Yeah. So... But there are some there are some brilliant designs out there that will you can just you know it's just a transfer yeah and it, you know like not, does it matter what you do with yeah, it ninety nine p for a pack of those so uh, yeah brilliant idea Derek so thank you for fabulous that. Yeah. mate and it works works a treat so I don't know I have booked a Kickstarter mm. I've sort of booked I back to back to Kickstarter yes obviously which is the War and Empire free one obviously. Yes, we were chatting, uh, uh, and obviously that, sure, that was the interview that you missed. We were chatting with uh, we were chatting with Mr. Cooper about that. So uh, mm, yes. yes, yes, he he was very relieved that you weren't on the show to start quizzing yes. to start quizzing him about Byzantines. <laughs> I, I don't know very much about Byzantines. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> well, it's all right. Obviously, yeah. he's not here. So yeah, so back that one and. That's nearly it, really. Oh, I've, I've ordered some Charlie Foxtrot. They've done some markers, some acrylic markers, which are useful sh- for sharp practice. Oh, cool. So I've got some There's Charlie Foxtrot. They just do mm, bloody yeah, nice stuff. Really. End of story. Uh, that's about it. Cool. 
<laughs> cool. Now, okay, so that's about it. I mean, there is one other thing, uh, the elephant in the room that has just, la- as we were speaking, that has just launched on Kickstarter. And, and I have kind of, well, I backed it, but it isn't me that's backed it, honest. <clears throat> Uh, which uh, because I, I, I backed it because uh, Josh, uh, well, he, he uh, he's he's gonna pay me back for it, honest dad. Uh, which is the uh, which is the uh, Batman Kickstarter, which is the new Kickstarter for Monolith. Uh, which mm. somebody has been exchanging texts with me over the afternoon, kind of going, "Talk me out of it, Neil. Talk me out of it." <laughs> <laughs> it does look nice. I played the, uh, as I say, I played the, uh, the the, uh, the kind of prototype version that they had at the UK Games Expo uh, last year, and it is good. And then you look at what they've done with now with, uh, you know, uh, you know, with like uh, the player boards and stuff, and you kind of go, oh, that looks nice. And it is. I mean, it's still. It's yeah. You know, it's using. Co- it's using Conan. Uh, yeah, the Conan mechanics, which we which we love, uh, but with extra. But with extra bells and whistles. Mm. Uh, interesting that, as I said. Uh, I mean, yeah. I said. I, I said to Hobbs, he's like. Uh, I said the thing is, if Josh mm. wasn't going to, because I mean, Josh is a huge DC fan, so he's like, he went, yeah, yeah, yeah I love that. Don't you back it, Dad? Because I want it. Oh, okay, fair enough. Go on, give me that. Can you? Uh, well, quite yeah, uh, but there's like. If he didn't mm. want it, well, would I have backed it anyway? Yeah, that's the quandary I'm in. Because I'm, I'm not a DC fan. I don't care about Batman. Mm. But looking at the mechanics and the quality of the stuff... And, I know for a fact yeah. I don't you know, time. The re- yeah, The really interesting of, thing yeah. I, f- I found on that Kickstarter though, <laughs> was the comment they made about why it went Kickstarter exclusive. And especially when they basically turned around and said, well, actually, the mm. problem was we didn't make any money on Conan. And if you think about the amount of money they raised on Kickstarter, and they basically turned around and said, by the time they got it all made, and then done all the uh, done, done all the discounts to all the distributors uh, for putting the retail versions in, they didn't actually make any money on it. No, I've, I've, I thought they said they didn't make money on what they put out to the distributors. They made money oh, on the game. Okay. Yeah, but they didn't. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So when they put yeah. out to the distributors, they didn't make any money on any money on and I basically turned around and said if we did it with Batman especially considering the cost of the Batman license hmm. we'd have to charge about two, between two and a half and three times as much for it as we are by not including the uh, the distribution chain yeah so you can kind of understand where they're coming from okay. yeah because I mean what's the normal dis- distributor dis- discount is about 40 40 50 40 50 percent isn't it yeah it's got to be yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is, is that about us done yeah, but, but wait, but so. wait, but wait. We have just a little bit of time for a brand new section, which was which was hinted at last time. That be next section is what has my other mate Dave bought this week? What has your other mate Dave bought this week, Neil? Oh, God. Well, I took him to Robin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I noticed he came round with you when you didn't play the Dead Army game. Uh, indeed, and uh, and 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 it turned out to be um, slightly more expensive than what he originally <laughs> planned. I think <laughs> that bag looked heavy. That that was one of the other reasons why we didn't play because he was kind of going, "Oh, I want to go back to the car." <laughs> You could have put it on the floor. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, so Lame. he went for... Okay, so he's, he seems to have gone gone into Gangs of Rome. Oh, God, he's bought time. Rome, hasn't he? Has he bought a Colosseum? Not yet, not yet. He's pretty nearly bought Rome. No, he hasn't. Just a suburb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a small <laughs> suburb. Yes, he, yes he, did, he did buy one of the shrine bundles. Okay. He, he bought one of the terrain bundles, and then he bought uh, he's bought some uh, some more fighters. So he's now got a full set of ten. Uh, and then uh, he also bought oh um, he, have you come ac- Hobbsy, Have you come across Dave's War Games? No. Right. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, he uh, he's a guy. He, he's only recently started up. I think he started up last year. 
another uh, another guy is making MDF stuff. Uh, makes some nice little MDF stuff. One of the great one of the things he does really nicely, he does these superb round paint stands. And Mr. Hickman is uh, is getting to the point where well, he's starting to buy more paint because he's actually starting to paint figures. Uh, and uh, saw one of these paint stands. Uh, some oh, let me see it. I think he saw it. I think it was either partisan last year, uh, and kind of went, "Oh, I'd like one of those." Uh, so he bought one. Uh, they they are a thing of beauty, but they are quite large. Uh, so yes, other than his usual pre-ordering of um, pre-ordering of of all things Fantasy Flight, because you know as soon as they announce uh, as soon as they announce a, a you know a new expansion for the latest Arkham Horror or Imperial Assault or Abu, he, 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 he's he's, he's also going to click a button somewhere. Uh, but no, so uh, uh, yes, he bought. Rather a lot of MDF at Robin, which is quite dangerous. He's also coming with me to Hammerhead at the weekend, so oh uh, watch this space. Oh <laughs> yes. However, I can report that at this current time, he still hasn't bought an airbrush. Although he has been, to, although he has been talking to me about going to um, the uh, uh, going to Barwell uh, to do one of their airbrush courses, which are very good, by the way. Uh, very good, and very good, uh, yeah. and uh, and yeah. Let's let, let's just s- s- stay away from talk of three D printing, okay? For now, has he bought Memoir Forty Four off you yet? Not yet. Not, not, Dave, not yet. Buy it. Oh dear. Although at the moment it, it is looking rather resplendent on one of his shelves. Oh, you've left it there. Have you were like a little little tester. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just so, just so, yeah, just, just so, so every time he's he, he's there, he, he, you know, in his room painting, what have you, it's just sitting in the corner of his eye, sitting, staring at him, going. Well, remember, what you need to do is, is pick it up and go. I'm just going to take this back home, Dave, unless you want to buy it off me. <laughs> <laughs> he's coming to Chilcom, and he is actually coming to Salute as well. Oh, dear God. Indeed. I said, Dave, you've got to come to sleep. There's all these different people there. <laughs> oh, I forgot to say. I forgot to, the, the big news. The big earthquake news here in Wales. Oh, yeah? Well, you know we had that big earthquake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I spilled some paint because of that earthquake. You, you spilled paint? Well, I actually spludged my brush because it went... <laughs> and I sort of jumped, thinking, what the hell was that? And I, yeah, spilled a little bit of paint. Did, did you ruin a finger? So, there we go. No, I managed to wipe oh. it off. Well, in that case, then, what you need, what you need is one of those new uh, resin paint pot holders that uh, Fenris Games have just released. Have you seen them? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <That's> a great <laughs> idea. Not for me, though, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, especially for those people who are really good at knocking over the the, the large pots of uh, of GW yeah. wash. <laughs> to which, to which, the real key message here is: go and buy something by Vallejo with a dropper bottle and be done with it. No, the GW washes are very good. Yeah, they are nice. I, I, yes, I know that's contentious. <laughs> right, and on that note, I think it, I think it really is time to it really is for time to to, to finish this section. Uh, Unless you've, unless anybody has anything on their shopping radar. Oh God, yeah. You mean that shopping radar? That shopping radar. Oh God. Stop it now. <laughs> it keeps going longer than you think it does. <laughs> I am just at, the, at this point in time. I am just kind of going mm, March the twenty second. Can't spend any more money before March the twenty second. Why would that be? Oh, you don't care. Now Star Wars Legion's coming out March twenty second. Yeah, no reason to spend any money on that. Don't need at all. Well, I I can quite categorically cal- say that at this point in the podcast, I don't need to buy anything else, and I will not buy anything before the end of the podcast. Oh, that's that's not really a very big achievement, of uh, Shall we wait to the end of the podcast and see how we get on? I've um, um, got my eyes on those lovely folks from Empires at War who've been building the uh, 28 mil and 15 mil Spanish and uh, Italian buildings. We've just added another five. 
So I shall I shall clearly have to have a treasure catch to buy them. You must have a whole city worth now of 50 mil Italian builders, Mike. Um, I can build a pretty big town, yes. Um, <laughs> the one thing I am missing is a really big Italian monastery. Just get a pile of rubble, because, I mean, they, they didn't last long. In, in, <laughs> it's going to uh, end up like that eventually, yeah, yeah fair point. Fair yeah. point, fair point. <laughs> Yeah. Harsh but fair. Just go get a twenty kilo bag of um, gravel and just empty it up on top of the table. Yeah, yeah, that'll do. Yeah, see yeah. that—that was the monastery. It's pretty short until we got to it. But yeah, um, so, so I'm, I'll probably be picking those up. And I'm in the pro- I'm also in the process of sticking a new I ain't been shot them deck through artscale dot com. Um, other than that, I think that's it. Back to writing. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at buildings and decide trying to decide which set of buildings I'm going to buy for Peninsula War. Whether I'm going to buy uh, a set that's ready painted or am I going to buy a set of War Bases modular ones and do some modelling work with them. What scale are you doing? Mil, just for Forager. 15? Yeah, it's for Forager. Do worse than get the two Empires at War Well, they do them in 28. They do them in 28. They did the twenty eight as well, and they're pre-paint. They're just pre-painted and assembled. Uh, yeah, there, there are several really nice ones out there, and I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering what. what they... Yeah, I mean, the the two sets will cost you a grand total of. Well, that's all of it, isn't it? Click. That's five. That's that's five kits. That's a hundred. It'll cost you hundred ninety quid. But that is ten buildings, including a villa. Well, when you say hundred, um, well, when you say hundred ninety quid, and, when uh, okay, uh, you'll then have to do the work on them. But 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 you can get all, I can get all the buildings that I want for war bases for forty five pen. Okay, I then I then have to model them and paint them and what have you. But you know, you have to paint them. And and how's the painting time going these days? Oh, it'll be fine. Spanish buildings, you just paint them off color white. That's it, um, and and and, yeah, and besides, uh, besides, I, I haven't got into why I haven't been painting, which is all, which is all to do. It, it, it's it's all, all been to do with kind of um, yeah, so, uh, uh, having sort outs. Yeah, which is which, which yeah, which is da- which is dangerous in itself. Uh, yes, which is why, which is which is in similar reasons for why the Duck's Brick Compendium is not progressing as fast as I'd like. Yeah, and of course the other thing is is that I'm looking at Rome as you do. And especially some of the the latest sets that Sumo have released, the latest construction sets that's under construction sets that Sumo have released, which are seriously nice. So I've been, uh, yeah, I'm kind of looking at Rome and kind of thinking that's on my shopping list for the non too distant future. So the next few months is going to be a bit terrain tastic. Terrain tastic. It's going to be a bit terrain tastic plus. Uh, uh, plus the odd set of figures for our, you know for yeah because Forager are coming out with some new figures uh, but I will not steal uh, 80s Thunder uh, you you'll be able to hear that from him in a couple of weeks indeed so shall we um, crack on with the interview we'll crack on with the interview shall we cool we okay let's take a break and we'll come back with the interview and yes this time we only, we really are talking to Lucid Eye Publications. The nation is vast. There are battlefields of old, great convention halls, and worlds of fantasy to explore. Who will guide us across this great geek nation? Since 2010, Geek Nation tours have been providing holidays for groups of like-minded people. Whatever your nature of geek, tabletop gaming, TV, film, comic books, sports or science. Geek Nation Tours caters for you. Visit www.geeknationtours.com for more details and join the great Geek Nation. Have you ever wondered what's going on in Wargaming? We do too. So come with us as we go behind the hobby with the Meeples and Miniatures interview. (laughs) 
We'd like to welcome back to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast for the first time in a very uh, Men in Black sort of way, Mr. Joe Seller from uh, Lucy You're going Dolly... to have to explain that, you know. I've got deja vu. What's happening? <laughs> yes. Who am I? Mike, before you so rudely interrupted, I, I, I was going to explain that, but you know. It's all this wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff. Yes, anyway, uh, right, so to carry on with my introduction, it is Mr. Joe Seller from Lucid Eye Productions. Hello, Joe. Hello. Hello. All right, it's good, good to speak, to it's, it's good to speak to you again for the first time. Yeah, it's good to be back. Yeah, uh, and yeah, to explain, this is, uh, take two of an interview that we originally recorded, um, ooh, best part of a month ago, I think, uh, at least three weeks ago. Uh, uh, unfortunately, due to uh, technical issues that uh, we still haven't worked out quite what happened, uh, we only managed to, although our, uh, uh, our software said it had recorded the entire interview, uh, when I came to edit it, uh, we only had the first 23 minutes. Uh, so we were, we were all cut off in our prime. We couldn't let you just listen to 20 minutes of Joe, especially since I think you know, the best bit's on the end. Uh, so, so we thought there was nothing for it. We had to have him back. Uh, so, hello, Joe. Welcome back. How you all doing? No, we're good, mate. We're good. Thank you for uh, yeah. Thank you for spending the time to come back on and say many apologies for the for the slight technical fault last time. Uh, so, no worries. It's fine. I've got my faults today anyway, haven't I? So, we're all. <laughs> okay, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Right, okay. So, uh, so Joe, um, before we go any further, uh, as regular listeners will know, and of course, as, as, as you now know, when we first have somebody on the show, the first thing we find out is something about their gaming credentials, something about uh, what have they been doing in the hobby up until this point, and, and what has brought them to, uh, to where they are now. So, uh, my first question to you, as way of introduction, is uh, how did you get into the hobby? Yeah, so um, as I sort of went into last time, I skirted around it a lot. It's not necessarily something I engage with regularly, but I love the narrative. I love everything that goes on within it. Um, I love, you know, like engaging with games and playing games, but the hobby itself, I don't really paint, uh, for example, nor do I, you know, attend uh war gaming clubs but i do like playing the games and i enjoy engaging with the material and i think that's sort of important to a point um from what i'm doing because obviously I'm, if i'm too much of a hobbyist then i'll just getting you know it, everything will be very sort of emotional and it'd be a bit too close to it so that's sort of how i see it anyway oh right okay so yes yeah, so, so very much kind of on the fringes as such so in that case, yeah, how yeah. on earth did you get involved in a hobby company? So basically, how it happened originally is um, my as my my dad, the sculptor who is the lucid eye sculptor Steve Sala, he um, originally sculpted some Savage Core miniatures when he was working for Warlord Games, and I, uh, uh, when I was at university, felt inclined to maybe try and at least get some rules up for the game because you know it was this range of miniatures. Uh, nothing really was happening with them so it seemed like a good idea a good foot in the door to you know experiment try something out and uh you know with a great range of miniatures and see how it goes so uh started writing up the rule set um i had you know not not great experience in wargaming when i was a kid i used to play you know a fair bit of little bits of rpgs and whatnot and delve into various avenues of games but I played, you know, video games, computer games, an array of games, so it sort of all went into that. So it was a bit different in that respect. And uh, tried it out to see how it went, and uh, it haven't looked back since. And, uh, you know, we're on to the next project now, and we've got a foot down, and it's all going well. And I hope it uh, continues that way. I'm sure it will. So that's sort of how we got into it. And then we just, you know, when my dad left Warlord, we just thought, you know, well, might as well throw everything at it. So it's sort of just gone like that, to be honest, Neil. Oh, right, okay. So how long has Lucid Eye actually been um, an entity as a company? About five months. Oh, right, oh, right. So, so, so pretty much brand new. 
Yeah, I mean, it doesn't feel brand new because, you know, when you're doing it every day for God knows how long and every weekend it feels quite long, but it, it, it is like it is only five months, but every day feels like a month in itself. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's new. So, Joe, uh, think... so most people will know your dad from his uh, quite extensive body of work that he's done for, for, for various people over the years. Uh, but uh, as I say, when it comes to Lucid Eye publications, uh, mm-hmm. they might not know quite what your, uh, you know, actually what you produce and what your core ranges are. So it's probably best if we have a quick look to see what you've been sure. doing. Okay, so uh, is it fair to say uh, the first thing we should have a look at is Savage Core? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the establishing range. Uh, that's what we started on. So I, w- I would, re- yeah, I'd say it was relatively important to start on that. Okay, cool. So what's Savage Core all about then? So um, Savage Core is basically a pulp skirmish game. Um, it focuses around the boss and the bods. And the whole idea is sort of using your mooks to protect your boss. Um, there's various relics and tricks and uh you know, archaic spells which are thrown across the battlefield as you're having this uh, skirmish game between various factions. Um, there's there's various scenarios sort of capture the sunstone. It's it's, it's a very pulp based game which harks back to you know the, that use that use of wording uh, and the feeling of the era, as it were. So it's all in there, and it, it's a very fun, fast paced game. Um, we just brought out the Age of Ice miniatures. Now, we only really just decided this today, but we're actually going to do a Savage Core Knight. Um, and we're sort of going through the timeline whereby you've got Savage Core, you've got the Age of Ice, where the core itself freezes over. And then obviously, you've got sort of the apocalyptic era, which is Savage Core Knight, where the lights go out in the core, as it were, and all these sort of, uh, you know, demonic and cultist entities come forth throughout the cracks so that's right. sort of where we bring with the range um we've recently you know I, I mean i'm just going train a fort here neil but i might as well um we've recently as well decided that we might do night and age of ice which is the expansion into sort of one entity which is savage core 2 sort of compiling everything uh but we were recently talking about that today so so yeah that's news for anyone who's into savage core it's probably where it's going. But we have the bulk range of miniatures, which is Savage Core, then Age of Ice. And what we like to do is we like to release everything first uh, and then provide a supplement. So those people who collect miniatures, you know, for collecting nice miniatures or painting miniatures can, you know, get them uh, rather than a big sort of hefty release all in one. So that's sort of what we're doing with Savage Core. And that's basically the main body of the game. OK, so when we're looking at uh, these Really rather nice miniatures that we're looking at for Savage Core. Uh, so, um, how does uh, how does a warband hold together? And and you know what what sort of figure count are we looking at in this game? Sure. So basically, with Savage Core, the entry point is very low. Uh, the reason we like to do this is because, given the range, uh, what it was, it was comprised of a boss and two packs of bods. So that is all you need as an entry point. Now the game is scalable, not to the degree where there's massive sort of war bands, you know, saga saga style as it were, but there is the entry point is basically a boss and a couple packs of bods. Um so all the codes are there. Uh, the new figures which you'll see on the website, if anyone's having a look uh, as they're listening to this, which is Age of Ice, the rules aren't out yet for that supplement, but there will be rules for the those characters as well and factions. So yeah, it's just a boss and a couple packs of bods and it's arranged as such. So the factions are, you know, they got the Corlocks, the Simians, Amazons, Neanderthals, Cro Magnons, Jaguar Tribe, the Id, the Atlanteans, Project Sturm, and obviously an array of encounters. Right. So that's all the broad brush of it. Okay, so bods you're looking at either uh, well generally uh, most factions seem to have six figures, although there were a couple that appear to have eight. Uh, yes, yeah. Simians, for example, have eight. Yeah. And then obviously you have, yeah, you have the uh, the boss figure, and then so then you have what they call encounters. How, I mean, how do these work? So we've got a system in Savage Core which is basically a double trouble encounter. Now the system of the encounters is if you're rolling both rolling for initiative, uh, and you roll the same number. 
what is then uh, instigated is a double trouble encounter. Now, the encounters are bots, as it were. They're AI mechanics in themselves. So it might be the case whereby we both roll the same number in an initiative. I'm stuck on the corner of the board and a t- uh, you know a T-Rex enters the board and makes its way across the map. Anyone caught in that sort of line of uh, direction will be, you know, eaten, taken up in its little arms and taken off the board. So these encounters play a vital part in sort of that pulp skirmish fun mechanic whereby encounters can uh, be occurred at any point in the game at the start of the turn. So those encounters you see on the website are the ones that, you know, are present within the book. And uh, just to go back to your point there, Neil, about having more codes for the simians. Yes. So, so the ones on the website, which, you know, have the blue age of ice in the corner, they are the new releases. Um, and that's what the supplement will be addressing all of the age of ice releases. Cool. Okay. So we've got Warband of, of our, uh, of seven figures, NPCs yeah. running around the place. Uh, obviously various different Warbands. I mean, can you give us a brief overview of how Savage World actually works? What kind of games mechanics was? Different factions naturally have different abilities. So it works by, you know, a very simple stat block system. Uh, You have, you know, mocks. Okay, so we've got synonymous names for the actual attribute. So we've got, uh, if I can remember, because it was longer, Moxie, Moxie, Guts, Clip, Buff, something else <laughs> basically those stats represent what the figure is is good at so you got clip which is your speed you got moxie which is your luck uh, you got guts which is your courage and you got buff which is your strength and there was one more thing but i've completely forgotten so basically those are your stat blocks and each character boss obviously have has better stats um all bods which are you know your faction your standard rank and file units as it were um a one shot so when they get hit and a successful hit has been taken on your bod, he's out of the game. So the whole crux of the game circles around keeping your boss alive okay. and using various tricks uh, within the game to debilitate the other bods and take down the opposing boss. Right. Okay, so so uh, is, it, is it like a buckets of dice sort of game or...? Um... Of course. So there's a, um, if I can remember correctly, D10 based game. Sorry, it's been a long time since I went. Yeah, I think mean, figures D10 based game. And basically, so it's quite swingy, which is nice. Um, and basically, what it circles on is just that D10 mechanic. And, you know, adding your stat. It's not a roll under, it's actually a roll over mechanic. So you plus that to your stat. Combat's dealt with in one wave. Range is dealt with in one wave. Tricks are dealt with in one wave. So it's sort of whoever wins initiative, it, it bounces. So it, it's, it's a wave based turn. Right. So everyone sort of does their actions in the turn uh, with that mechanic. And then it, it, follows and all effects are normally resolved within the turn sequence opening up a new turn uh, with the potential for obviously a double trouble which can you know naturally uh, throw off a lot of your tactics in game so what sort of time does a normal game play so naturally a normal game will anywhere play from anywhere to in between just over an hour between two so naturally you can have it done I'd say about one hour 30 is the appropriate timing for it. Obviously, you know, with every game, with, you know, the mechanics, it can go quicker. But but this game, uh, with turn in phases, it should last around that. That's that's a very standard upfront skirmish, that would be. Based within the Earth's core. So the whole idea, okay. it's got this sort of 50s, uh, you know, pulp frame around it, whereby the game is situated within the Earth. Um, so you've got that sort of humour and that pulp aspect. You know, you got your monkeys, your chimps, you got your Atlanteans, you got your Amazons. So there was all that going for it, and that's where. So, so with the timeline as such, what we've done is, you know, our narrative basis, as, as it were, for the for the project. You got your Savage Core, and then you've got your Age of Ice, where you know you've got the meddling id and and the and the, the core, as it were, cools down to a point of an ice age. And then what we're going to bring in is Savage Core Night, which is sort of uh, when that subsides and it's more post-apocalyptic. So, so we've got that sort of timeline going with the narrative, which we're going to instill. Yeah, it's sort of very um, 1970s B movie style. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, big time. Yeah. Now, can I use a submarine in it? He says, I in, I in his submarine he bought last year and he hasn't used. Project Stern. With Project Stern, that might be uh, advisable, actually. Yeah, Winter Nazis. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're just so cool. Yeah, frozen submarines and winter Nazis. That's what that's what would be good with. 
these Nazis get everywhere, don't they? They're on the moon, they're at the Earth's core. God. Yeah. Yeah, they got the ray guns. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. They, um, yeah, I'd advise playing it with them. Yeah, so basically, uh, Michael, um, the Nazis are the Project Sturm faction, which are basically, you know, a lost uh, Nazi unit, as they were. They found their way down to the core through paths untraveled, and they've, they've stumbled upon this, this alien tech. It's ambiguous as to whether they, they brought it themselves or whether it's, you know, in related, relation to the id, all this sort of space tech uh, that's above and beyond the time. But that they've found their way down to the core, and that's sort of what that faction's about. So they, they sort of set up posts, as it were, around the core, and it's more of a reconnaissance um, project. But yeah, so that's the Nazi faction. We've got the core locks as well, which you know are based on on whatnot, and that they're new. So all these Ice Age factions will have uh, be featured in the in the newest supplement as well for the game. Yeah, it's quite nice because you've got quite a lot of different styles of, of factions in in here. Was it your dad who came up with the with the sort of um, design for for all of these, or was it something? Yeah, that you I mean, the guy. I mean, this is the thing. You you, you got to let the guy do what he wants. I mean, obviously we chat and uh, we say, "Oh, do you think that'd be a good idea?" Not necessarily. Is that uh, you know a bit overused? Did it? Did it? We go through that process. However. You know, naturally, he's the sculptor. Um, he can design things better than me. Uh, and you just got to let him rock in that respect. So, yeah, the, the conversation's there. And we, we chat and we decide on things. But it's very loose. It's very loose. You know, he does what he wants in that respect. <laughs> yeah. The sort of level of, of sculpting in this is, is excellent. And I think you can really tell that he's, that he's enjoyed sculpting these. Yeah, definitely, Michael. I mean, naturally, I think that comes down to, you know, doing things for yourself, as with all walks of life, when you're you're doing things that you want to do, they, they come out better. And I think that's exacted in his work. And I think that's prevalent, especially with the newer elf stuff, which is something we've always wanted to actually do and see in the flesh and get done. And with someone like Rick Priestley working with us, which we're very, you know, excited to have, we can these things can finally be realised and the same with the other projects and other ranges. We're finally, you know, getting a foot in with the stuff and it's full in shape. And, and that's another thing just to add. Um, the, the ranges as such sort of provide us gateways to be able to sculpt what or, or design whatever wants to be done because they're, they're, they're different enough to be able to do that, really. So, okay, Joe, right, before you say anything more, you mentioned Rick Priestley and you mentioned elves. Sure. Right, which is enough to get me um, salivating a bit. So <laughs> the elves are obviously the red, the red Book of the Elf King range that you've got out. Yeah. Which, which are so nice, I've just bought them. And, you, and then you mentioned Mr. Priestley's um, hallowed name. So Yes. Um, what's, what's happening? <laughs> Yeah, so basically, uh, Michael, what happened was originally we, uh, our project, the Red Book of the Elf King, we understood that Rick wanted to do something fantasy based. So we presented this to him. He sort of came in, we had a chat, and we, we, we meshed really well over it. And uh, we haven't really looked back since. I mean, the project's pretty much on the verge of being finished and sent to print very soon. Um, the then we're past the final revision stage, I think. Um, so, yeah, it, it's gone really well. Um, and Rick's been absolutely fantastic. And it's been lovely working with the guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, uh, yeah, so he's written the game system, as it were. The Red Book of the Elf King, the project, uh, the narrative is Lucid Eye Publications. And we've worked with him to, you know, bring the set of rules out. And it will form the basis of the the game uh we've got a deck of cards as well for the glamours which is the spells that elves and the uh fanes will toss across the battlefield to one another so yeah that's sort of what rick's part is in the in the project so you you, you probably can't say that much about sort of the, the rules and everything because obviously it's, it's not out yet but um is is a similar sort of size to savage savage core or are you thinking I'm happy to talk about the rules, Michael, honestly it's um oh. We're at, we're at the point now where it's silly not talking a bit about them, I guess. So yeah, I mean, so so the game plays. It's 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 a bigger sized game than Savage Core, Michael. It 
involves a Thane and six groups of companions. Now, what the Thane does is naturally they have their own statistics and their own narrative and flavour and reasons, and, you know, existential crises and whatnot. So we've kept it quite um, narrative heavy in that sense. This is all law. This doesn't have to be applied to the game, but yeah. we, we like the setting and we like having a strong thematic uh, appeal for a game because it, it's important to have, we believe so anyway. So the the Thanes uh, wield their own glamours and they each have, you know, a spell casting melee to class glamours. The, these are sort of the powerful spells, as it were, and their body of companions is their circle, so their family. So the whole setting is based around an elf civil war. Now, these families are fighting for control of the kingdom, given the disappearance of Elim the Elk, Elf King. Uh, now, Elim the Elf King fell under a sickness of melancholy, a sickness of the soul, and has disappeared to the outworld. So since the disappearance of the Elf King uh, and his Red Book, as it were, these... Thanes and these families are fighting in an elf civil war setting for the uh, control of East. So that's the narrative, the main thrust of the narrative. So it's it's very literary based in that sense, and there's a lot of those influences that are, that that you'll see when you you pick it up. Now the game itself it evolves around these sets of companions in a Thane uh, fighting other circles and other families. And, and we, and we have various weird meetings, as they're called, which are scenarios, which, you know, might you might see uh, featuring the Changeling's Blade, for example. Elin might feature the Elf King himself, might come onto the battlefield in sort of a spectral form uh, and be chaotic in that nature. So they've, they've got all this stuff going for it. Now, the, would you like to know, you know, more mechanic-based? Um, if you ask me any questions about that, Michael, I'll try and direct and tailor my answer around that. <laughs> uh, the, the answer is yes, 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 and yes, please. So, uh, <laughs> because we we do like to know about rules and how they work. Okay, so, great. So, yeah, I mean, just sort of talk us through, I mean, you, you said it, it, it's a Fane and six six groups of companions, so. Yeah, they are. Um, you- What's that, about 18 figures, 19 figures? Yeah, yeah. So it's not massive. It's about mid-level. You know, you can scale it up. The scalability yeah. is there. And we have got an entry-level scenario in the book, which is just getting used to the mechanics um, mm-hmm. of the game with less, just to sort of try, you know, actually engage and move stuff about and, and, and activate the spells. Um, so the game works um, for a chip pull system which makes it, I believe, a lot more mercurial and faster paced. Uh, so once you, you know, you, you roll for the, the turn, the amount of chips you get, tokens, as it were, um, once you know the system, the game flows very well and very fast. So naturally, you know, say I, th- there's an equalizing dice. So say we both roll a D6, I get a four, someone else gets a six, and then we get a five uh, on the neutral dice, as it were. Someone gets 11, and correct me if I'm wrong, the other guy gets nine, I guess. So you put your chips in the bag, and then it's a case of, you, you pull the bag, uh, okay, this player goes, this player goes, that player might go four times, that player might go two times. And what that does is it enables the uh, the game to, once you know the game, to really pick up and your tactics are always, and, and when you use your spells are always, it's never cohesive because it could be interrupted at any point. So we, we like that fast style play and that's something we really liked about Savage Core, which um, we talked about for Elf King. But obviously this is a completely rich mechanic, but... It's uh, it works really well. Okay, so so you you say that you've got like a bag of chits, you know, with, yes. with two colours for each side. So you pull out a chit, that chit allows you to do something. Is is that sort of like um, activate a group of companions sure. or you know, cast a spell or or do something like that? Is there a set number of things that you can do with each chit? So it becomes more of a resource management of you know, do you use that chit to activate a unit and, and hope you get another one out to do something else, or I suppose what I'm trying to get at is, are there very specific things that you can do with these chits, or are they just a resource that you can use for multiple things? So basically, uh, you're completely right, uh, Michael. So basically what the chit does is it it acts as an activation. So you can, with this chit, you can be able to move. uh, You can use rude magic, as it were, which is low-level magic, which means you can throw magic, which is essentially a ranged conflict. Um, you can attack, you can move, you can charge and attack, or you can use your feint to activate a glamour. Now, 
you in the game you pick seven glamours. Now this is your shopping list, as it were, Michael. What this does is it allows you to tailor a build, as it were, tailor a circle around a selection of glamours you like to play. Now we have well over fifty-four glamours, so there's a lot of choice um, for your circle. Um, and what these activation chits do is once a turn, you can try and activate a glamour. Now, you may fail to pull that glamour off. Naturally, you know, the shell golden hand is worse off at classic casting glamours than Mexant Farseer. Spoiler alert, I've just dropped the name of one of the fanes that's coming out. Um, <laughs> we use like a more warlock based fane. So these things have different abilities and different glamours so it'd be silly to take uh, a high level glamour for the shell whereas you could use one for mexican so the shopping list aspect is in the card deck which is the glamours and that's sort of where you you build around now with these chits you can activate you know all of these basic mechanics in the turn but you have to activate your unit before you can get back to him so i can't sit there and keep dropping glamours on my thing because i can only class one a turn and i have to activate all my units before i get back to him if that makes sense so it works like that. And when you activate any of these abilities, you know, rude magic or charge or whatnot or uh, various combats, you would put the activation chit on your unit to show that it's been activated for that turn. Now, if we have an overhaul of chits, let's say, uh, let's say we have three units left and I get, you know, 12 chits, I can keep reactivating my units when I get round to them if they've been activated, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. So it, it, it's always going to work on the number of chits you got, but it, the, the number of chits you get is randomised at the beginning of, of the turn? Yeah, so you, you with the resolution of the turn naturally follows the opening of another turn, which would mean rolling D6, both players, and then a neutral D6 to, to balance the swing, as it were, to stop people, you know, getting one chit and, and ten. They still swing, but it, it acts as a very nice neutraliser. So what that does is, yeah, you at the start of each turn and at the end of the turn, what you do is you roll off, you know, if anyone's been pinned and they failed the courage test, uh, you try and roll off your chits. Uh, if you can't roll off your chits and you're still pinned and you, they fail their courage test, they, they've already been activated at the start of that turn, if that makes sense. So it might be more beneficial to try and pin units who are pushing you with uh, rude magic rather than charge them uh, and risk getting hurt yourself. There's various tactical avenues you can play in that regard. Okay, so so when you say that when when a unit is pinned, they you you actually lose a chit when you start the the, the turn. Yeah, Track. so it acts as a chit if that makes sense. Mm. Like like when you're pinned, you fail a courage test. Uh, that penalty counter will act as an activation. So if you fail to roll it off, it's it's like they've been activated, so they're pinned as it were. Yeah, that's quite nice. Yeah, I like yeah, that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's good in that respect, Michael, because what it does is it it actually makes you engaging in something you might fail quite deadly rather than just trying it given mm. you might yeah it does sound quite nice and tactical and the fact you got 54 sort of uh, glamours to choose from to give you a nice little bit of um I believe it's more than that, Michael, just 54 i don't know why i did it sounded nice maybe it's a deck of cards 54 in a deck of cards 54 yeah, in a deck of cards yeah. Yeah. 54 in a deck yeah. of cards with jokers yeah, yeah, it's it's more than that. I believe it might be over sixty, but we'll have a deck of cards for the glamours themselves. Mm. But yeah, that's nice. I like that. And sort of movement and combat use a sort of fairly standard me mechanics for that, or is a sort of randomising for movement. No, there's um, we we've standardised that because it's it's more tactical as it were. There's less swing, less swing. So you know you can move half and and use your rude magic as it were for a unit, uh, but you would take a penalty on being able to cast it. So you've got to really decide if you want to be aggressive, if you want to try and pin units, if you want to get away, if you want to try and play more spell based, if you want to hide your fame, if you want to take the risk and reward and you know be a glass cannon and move your fame forward. Forward. it's got all this going for it and it really relies on the shopping list that is your glamours as it were mm. um, and i refer to shopping list because there's not a point system and it plays with you know a standard allocation of a unit size and a uh, circle size the game has a lot of depth and it really comes from those systems and what you want to do and how how you build your glamours around your fane and your companions because they each have different stats um, and abilities dependent on what circle you play which is your your faction as it were yeah that sounds good. What about sort of, sort of for, uh, things like campaigns? Have you got sort of rules in there where you know you you sort of start off with like a minimal amount of glamours and you can build up by doing campaign play, or have you thought of something else to do? 
So what we're doing is the, the weird meetings, as it were, what we like is this sort of narrative and this timeline whereby everything ends naturally in the fall of all, which is, you know, the utter destruction of everything forged, you know, by the Elf King's hand. Um, and in that timeline, what you do is you play various scenarios, uh, various weird meetings, they're called, which uh, happen at various points of the timeline. Um, so, so you know, you, you might be trying to move, move and transport the Changeling's Blade as an artifact. Uh, so you can rewrite history, as it were, but it all happens on inevitable timeline. Now, what we're doing in relation to that campaign system, um, we have an idea. I don't necessarily want to... I can't really spoil what we're going to do with it, but we, we've got an idea of this sort of progression system, and it might be in the form of troll wars as it were and incursions to the land of east oh so it's always nice to have a nice incursion from outside yes yes especially when you've got another range of figures that will fit in quite lovely and uh, <laughs> give you that ability to do a bit of a crossover <laughs> yeah so the um i mean we, we we like to keep the setting nice and tight with the whole sort of fey civil war as it were and the disappearance of the elf king but there are inclinations and uh, there is an ambiguous nature of what is happening outside of east and these incursions have been hinted at yeah cool so moving towards uh, looking a, li a little bit at the figure ranges sure uh, and, and and how that links in with the game okay mm -hmm. so currently uh what we've got is We've got a, uh, a couple of things that you can get a hold of. Plus, there are four sets of uh, there are four sets of companions. Yeah. Now they're all armed with spear and shield, and uh, they look. I mean, obviously they're yeah they're kind of variations on the thing. Now, obviously, it's, I suppose it's a case of because it's a civil war, everybody's companions are going to be the same because you know it's yeah it's yeah. Yeah, that it's it's a civil war. They're elves fighting each other. Since we're talking elves, um, there seems to be a complete lack of I don't know uh, bows. <laughs> yes, um, we we try to um, have a fresh take on things. Now, the idea about the companions is it's it's got that sort of Teutonic that that uh, Celtic the Dark Age law behind it. Now, oh, okay. the reason we have the spear and shield is because the focus of the game is on the magic system and rude magic. Uh, naturally, because they are families of elves and they've sort of separated and 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 you know dis and intertwined between themselves with with their thane. That's the thrust of the game. Now they have a shared stat line as do they have shared miniatures. So how you use them is uh, reflective of what Fane and Circle you use, as it were. So that's why they're standardised. Oh, OK. So, uh, yeah, so, so actually, the look of the companions is very much hand-in-hand hand with the way the game has been designed. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the miniatures are for the game, no doubt. And, and the game is built around the miniatures. So, you know, say, uh, like Michael, so, so Michael's purchased some companions. Now, he, he's got two fanes. Um, when Michael's painted up that, you know, Salian Trollblood and Vashel Golden Hand, he can use his companions for each. So he could, you know, have a game with Vashel and playing as the, the Throne of Towers circle, or he can be playing as the Silent March, which is uh, Salian Trollblood circle. So naturally, uh, he would build his glamour list around Salian or around Vichelle, and these companions would have different attributes. Now, what that does is it allows, you know, if people want to buy companions for more fanes, they're more than welcome to because they can paint them up in tartan or various tones of bronze to, you know, reference their fane. But at least it gives them, you know, if they collect their fanes, they can play as every fane and use their companions as that army, essentially, as well. Okay. It's interesting the fact that in most skirmish games, uh, your yeah the composition of uh, your supporting units and their armament is fairly important. It seems almost in this is that that it's almost kind of secondary to effectively the magic system. Yes, um, it it it's secondary to 
the fane and the the glamours you would use not necessarily the circle because the circle has you know different attributes if if i'm playing as you know a reeler of the long isles which is uh, a fane that's coming soon um and 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 her um circle of companions uh given their sort of more mariner based and on fleet uh, you know more fleet nature about them they have more of a swashbuckling ability as it were where they can negate maybe an extra hit so so your 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 circle your body of companions has ability to, in relation to what circle you play as and who is your fane but you are completely right the system is about the fane and and their circle and, and the glamours and the, the spell system uh i feel like that makes it more tactical in a way because you're standardizing the units so what you do with them is more vital than what you pick Yes. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see what you mean. You're kind of teasing us and dropping in names here, here, there, and everywhere. Okay, so can you kind of give us some idea of um, the scope of where we're going? As we said, at the moment we've got... Uh, if, if someone goes and uh, having uh, heard this podcast and looks on uh, the Red Book of the Elf King, uh, yeah. you'll see four companion sets and two things. But you've already said, uh, okay, uh, a standard army is six sets of companions. So is yes. it going to be a case of it's a minimum of six, uh, uh, you'll, you'll have a minimum of six different sets of companions and then any number of things? Uh, you, you know, can you tease us with what sort, of thing, uh, what sort of thing we can expect to see? Of course I can. That's what I'm here for now. Yeah, so basically um, there will be two more sets of companions so there will be a body of six companions there'll be six sets of companions that you can use there are going to be six fanes as well um we've released two fanes there are going to be four more fanes uh there is going to be a third fane aurelia of the long isles coming very soon and followed by another three um so there will be six circles six playable circles um this is in in the game the red book of the elf king as it stands yeah uh there will be six circles. We will also bring out the Elf King in a figure form, which the game centers around. So he, he uh, Elim, the Elf King, will be a weird meeting. So that will be featured, and that's something to look forward to. Is he the... Uh, I'm assuming he's the he's the artwork that's featured on the webpage, yeah? Is that no, him? the artwork... Um, no, no, the artwork uh, was inspired by you know the fanes we'd done uh julian delvon uh, i've got to give him a shout out absolutely phenomenal artist um he uh we sent him some material he had a read through we had a chat and he he just drew something up in relation to what was there it's sort of a, it's sort of an amalgamation of everything really um there's not a direct character it's just a companion oh okay. it's an elf from the setting as it were yeah. oh cool it's, it's it's quite a fresh take on elves, isn't it? Because it, yeah, because it, it it's almost uh, as I say, they're very kind of like almost dark age, uh, vague, vaguely Nordic. Yeah, um, it's it's got all, it's got all that going for it. Um, it's got a lot of mythos in it. Uh, there's a lot of literary uh, fantasy from the canon that's been employed um, as inspiration. Um, I keep referring to it as literary, but it is. It really is. Um, you know, it's different, and we like to keep it that way. You know, elves aren't elves aren't humans with pointy ears. Their their society, as it were, and their culture, it, it doesn't repli- replicate. It, it's beyond human comprehension. They're you know spiritual entities, as it were, in forms. Then they're not humans with pointy ears, which is you know the more generic fantasy approach to elves. Is if they somehow replicate, you know, our societal standards and how we think about things. It's just, you know, a different entity in its entirety, and that's what we really wanted to get out with the game and and the narrative behind it. It's usually at this point that Mr. Shock comes up with his uh, Terry Pratchett quote. Yes, this is when he does his owl quote. <laughs> that's your cue, Neil. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It is my it is my cue. Unfortunately, I don't, I, I don't have it in front of me. Oh, you know how well we prepare for these things, don't you? <laughs> so, what's Neil's search of this? I've I, I got to say that I, I I do think that Pratchett did nail elves because he made them very un, 
unearthly yeah. and spiritual and took them right back to the sort of prime, primeval sort of style, isn't it? Yeah, Specifically yeah. yeah. Not not, this yeah. is the thing what we wanted to get out. They're not, they're not moral. The, yeah. Their morality doesn't play in the spectrum of human morality. It, it's an entirely different entity. It's beyond human comprehension. That's what we wanted to get at when we sort of created them. Yeah, it's a sort of pride and arrogance of an elf, isn't it? Are you back now, Mr. Chuck? Tell us about elves, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, t- t- uh, well, I, well I, won't, I won't tell you about elves. I will tell you how uh, Sir Terence Pratchett described elves, because that he seems to be describing the world uh, that, Joe has been dis- uh, that, that Joe has been painting for us. He says this, Elves are wonderful. They provoke wonder. Elves are marvellous, they cause marvels. Elves are fantastic, they create fantasies. Elves are glamorous, they project glamour. Which is spell name. I, I particularly like how you use that with spells. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. Elves are enchanting, they weave enchantment. Elves are terrific, they beget terror. The thing about words is that meanings can twist just like a snake. And if you want to find snakes... Look for them behind words that have changed their meaning. No one ever said elves are nice. Elves are bad. Elves are awesome. <laughs> By which we mean they provoke awe. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They provoke awe. Yes. Uh, and if you and if you wonder where that came from, uh, that is from uh, Lords and Ladies, in which Terry Pratchett. It is one of his best. Uh, but yeah, as I say, as Joe's been describing, you know, this world of the Elf King, that's the sort of thing uh, that immediately speaks to my mind, uh, of the world that, that has been created uh, between uh, between Joe and, and, and uh, obviously how Rick's weird in the, uh, uh, the rules as well. Not quite your standard yeah, Tolkienian definitely. Elf. Mm, this does look good. When's it out, Joe? Put it out, okay. To me. No, no, that's not too far. So, I mean, that's that's a that's 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 a good question um, because I have to think about that one. <laughs> right. So, I personally would like to see it out, and this is what I do. I'm gonna overpromise something and hopefully overdeliver. Um, January, February, March, April. In, I would like to see it in the next couple of months. So, salute then. Yeah, we've sort of set that as an arbitrary deadline. Not that there'll be, you know, a massive demo at Salute, but more so that so we can maybe provide presence there. Um, what, are you giving it away? <laughs> uh, no, we won't necessarily sorry. be giving it away. Um, <laughs> no, no so, oh, sorry, presence, yeah, not no, presence. No, 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 presence, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll come in my Santa hat, yeah? No, yeah. but yeah, I, uh, to be honest, Michael, that's what I can give you and that's me being honest but not 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 that you know we've set a deadline we, to be honest michael we don't really hold things back so when they're there they're there i mean we've set up various uh, things to do with retailers and stuff in the run-up so i'd sort of need to deal with that first before revealing that but i don't know a specific date to be honest very I, soon though. that's all right give, give me time to paint the things yeah, yeah, but that's the thing. Indeed. And 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 obviously, and obviously, Mr. Hobbs, you've also bought a dice back, haven't you? I I haven't, no, but the, they're, they're very nice. Pot. Yeah, they they are lovely, but unfortunately, I I am um, contractually obliged to um, saddle goose for dice bags, and oh, we've yeah, all seen. Awesome. Yeah. And the problem is, Matt is a lot taller than me. And if I ever went to another dice bag manufacturer, he, 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 that, he, the, the, term, the terms of that endorsement agreement are a bitch, aren't they, Mike? Yeah, they are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, the, I mean, the thing is about the bags, uh, we, we're going to provide everything for the game that you need to play the game. So naturally, we understand people like to use their own bags. They like to use their own dice. They like to use what they've got, and that's fine. But um, we feel we should still provide it. Oh, definitely. And yeah. It's a very nice bag, and I'll probably be getting one anyway because I am a bit of a sucker for dice bags. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And let, as I say, and let's face it, it's a really nice yeah. logo, and it looks really good yeah, on yeah. a dice bag. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, you have nailed it when it comes mm. to that. You really have. Uh, so this is uh, where we... Uh, okay, so this is coming out next couple of months. Yes. Any idea on price point of the rules? Yes. So the price point on the rules hasn't been absolutely determined. It will likely be between... It will likely be between 20 to 25 Okay, and is that for a softback or it's a hardback? It's for a softback book? book, and it will likely be 70 to 80 pages, maybe. It hasn't been fully paged uh-huh. full, this is This is me just... Ab- full full, full colour? Full color. Yeah, yeah, full colour, yeah. Full okay. colour with art and images, yeah. And, and, and a nice uh, nostalgic yeah. layout. Sounds good. Okay, so... Okay. Yeah, so that's the book. And uh, the cards as well, there'll be a deck of cards, a deck of glamours with all the spells in the game on them and a quick reference to the circles in there as well. Sure. So sure. where can we get them? So where can you get them? You can get them through Lucid Eye Publications and there will be various avenues. Um, there'll be various retailers who will also provide them. Uh, I don't want to get into a sh- stick saying them because then I might forget one and then they might, you know, email me and then <laughs> they might say, why didn't you mention me? So I, I was best to just say all good retailers. <laughs> cool. Okay. So, right. So it's talks about Savage Core, which was your, it, your first game. Uh, obviously, Red Book of the Elf King uh, coming very, very soon. And then you have um, a few other... Um, I hate to say bits and bobs, uh, right. but you kind of have a, a like little little ranges which uh, of you know uh, a few figures sure. which look incredibly nice. So we have uh, things like uh, citizens citizens of a far out dimension, the plot yeah. device, or the beasts of Birchwood, or treasures from the cosmic vault. Are these just figure ranges that you'll be adding to now and again or are these potentially um, future games they will all be future games everything we do will have a system provided with it Um, we like to release miniatures and then provide the supplement when we believe the you know the rules can compensate for the miniatures um, rather than the miniatures compensating for the rules so so yeah, basically, Neil, um, Treasures from the Cosmic Vault, for example, is a science fantasy based game. It's got all this retro uh, tropes, and it will have a game. It's going to be sort of gladiatorial combat on Titan, on the sands of Titan, and uh, exotic uh, gladiators hailing from different planets come to fight, as it were, for their their planet. That's going to mm-hmm. be the function of that game. It's going to be more RPG based in like character progression and maybe a permadeath feature um but we've got some very exciting news that i can't necessarily reveal as to you know who we'll be working with to do that as well um that's planned in maybe after the elf king um as a smaller project but not necessarily smaller less codes and and tighter in in the sense that because there'll be less codes and it focuses more on character uh we'll build it around that um, whereas the Beast of Birchwood is uh, sort of a horror narrative uh, dreamscape game, whereby each player will play as the the sleeper, which is uh, as as you'll see the funny looking uh, quaint characters in the animal costumes. Um, so it's it's a walking nightmare in that sense. And and when the Beast of Birchwood is slain, the the, the dream uh, the players escape from the dream. Um, so that's in the the fold as well um and naturally the plot device uh we're looking to make that sort of a uh, spy fi skirmish based game as well uh which is sort of Mm -hmm. features in this sort of 70s uh, alternate history golden age which is going to have you know all that all those tropes in uh, and whatnot so they're sort of the the free ranges addressed in you know again broad brush strokes so yes uh in short they will all have a system Cool, but uh, obviously at the moment, uh, as I say, these are things that are uh, in the future. Obviously, uh, because like the Elf King is the uh, uh, is the current thing you're working on. Cool. Yeah, I mean, um, in the future, but 
like us I mean we we move I I like to think we move pretty quick so when we've done a project it's not a case of finishing a project we'll always be you know improving the project we'll always be adding to the project we, we like having ranges and establishing the ranges so we can do things with them and so we can you know build them as you know entities and so we are like you know today we released a savage core character is Bal the crow uh, captain of the Atlantean reavers so we were always working on our lines and we we're always thinking of them uh, and when to do stuff for them and when to you know maybe give them a slight back seat while we uh, push something so so they're always being worked on so it will be fast i like to think um we will put things into motion very fast with things okay cool as we said that yeah there's a fair bit of stuff for, you know uh, for people to go out already uh, you know looking around with as i say i mean i mean the savage core range uh is it's getting to be quite extensive now what what teases me with the owl king i mean uh, any idea when all those miniatures for the Elf King are likely to be done and available for? I mean, as you say, I, I know we've got uh, effectively kind of half the figures yeah. available. Uh, w- will everything be available at the time of the launch of the Yes. Uh, what we're looking to do is we want to, again, provide the miniatures, uh, and then we're going to, you know, provide uh, the book and whatnot. We might do, we're looking at doing a pre order system with that for the game. Uh, for those people who don't have maybe mm-hmm. the miniatures in different retailers in different countries and whatnot, um, so that they can have a full experience. But yeah, definitely, like like Michael's, you know, picked up his minis. Um, there'll be more, and they'll be there before the game hits. So uh, obviously, like cool. like a lot of people like to do as well is you know they like to you know get a couple packs uh, at the end of the month or on a weekend or whatnot and get them painted and enjoy them for what they are. So we didn't really want to deny people that. Uh, pleasure, you know, in the run-up. Is also likely that you're going to have like a like a starter bundle. Yeah, there'll be there'll be various deals as as such, which might be you know um, one circle, you know, of your choice, as it were, in the book and a and a deck of cards, or you know there might be a two-player option, which is a couple of circles. Uh, the deals are currently currently sort of being revised and worked on at the moment um, in relation to what we have and what we will have, um, but we want the project to be full. Um, in relation to the launch of the game rules itself, and uh, so yeah, we we're always looking at it in that light. Well, Joe, thank you for coming on and uh, sharing with us uh, what you're doing at Lucid Eye. Uh, we've co- I, I, in the past we've kind of uh, been teased, and a couple of people said, "Oh, have you seen what's going on over there?" And uh, yeah, we kind of had a quick look and, and then had a look at some of the figures. I kind of gone, "Oh, they're nice." Uh, but hopefully, what uh, with chatting to you, it's really quite, kind of put some meat on the bones about you know what the company is all about, how everything ties in together. And as I say, then you come out and go, oh, Red Book of the Elf King, Alvin Civil War. What is not to like about that? Uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for coming on the show and uh, and, and and telling us all about that. We really thank you for having it. me. Really appreciate it. No, no problem at all. Uh, we wish you all the very best, mate, and uh, we look forward to seeing uh, everything. Um, hopefully, from recording this in oh, you know, six to eight weeks' time, that would be mm-hmm. cool. Just about give chance for Mister Hobbs to paint all his elves. Yeah, I just yeah. finished yeah. off another two hundred. I got two fist. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> shush, shush! They're talking new ones. You know, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look, we've just established that they're not proper okay. elves, all right. <laughs> you never have too many elves, that's what I say. Too right. So, uh, so Joe, yeah, thank, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, and so we wish you all the very best with, with Lucy and I. Uh, we look forward to catching up with you in the future and uh, seeing how everything's going. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Cheers. Brilliant, mate. Take care. Cheers, Joe. Cheers, mate. Cheers. We hope that you're enjoying this episode of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you are, would you like to support us? There's a couple of ways of doing so. You can become a patron of the show by supporting us on our Patreon page. 
There you can give regularly every time we produce a show. Alternatively, you may want to give a one-off donation, and you can do that by using PayPal. For more details on both these options, please click on the Donate tab on our website, www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. So, Mr. Hobbs, how did your pledge not to not to buy anything else before the end of the show work uh, work out then? Uh, I failed about five minutes in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come what on! Are you no, like? Those elves are fantastic. They are just so different to anything else out there. They really. I, I mean, as I say, uh, when you say elf, it conjures up a particular uh, a, a particular image of an elf, hmm. which those really aren't. No. It, I've, I've got to say the whole the whole range of Lucy Dye stuff is some of Steve Saller's best work, and and he's produced some cracking figures in his time, mm. but these are these are all something else. You can tell he's really enjoyed making them. Yeah, I uh, as well as well as the the owls. I mean, I, I I think the Amazons and the Atlanteans. Oh, the Atlanteans are cracking. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so nice. And, you know, and yeah, as I say, and then there's you know the the odd character figure here and there, and I've been thinking, oh my word, yeah, there are some really really nice figures in that in that bunch, really really good. And, and as you say, I mean, although it's although it's Savage Earth, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure half of the um, um, half of the uh, you know, the Ice Age stuff you could convert to a Frost Grave or all this that and the other, it'd be uh, it'd be fantastic. They look so cool. Yeah, there's a lot of use in those figures. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, and as we were saying, a thousand on one uses for a pulp Nazi. <laughs> Can never have too many pulp Nazis. Only a thousand and one. <laughs> Chucking some zombies just sorted. <sighs> Don't talk to me about zombies. Although, yeah, Nazi zombies I can just about do with. Uh, right. Are we about done then, chaps? I think we probably are. <sighs> Yeah, I think we probably yeah. are. Well, um, mm. thank you one and all for listening. I hope uh, um, I hope you've enjoyed our show. Let, let us know what you thought about of our of our new way of doing what we've been up to. And does that actually work, or you know, do you prefer us just uh, chatting less about stuff? I.e., was it a bit rambly? Was it a bit rambly? Did we go on a bit? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Although uh, apparently, some people like us doing that. That's why some people tune into the show, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> Good for them. Indeed. I love Alice. God bless you, Meeps. All of you. God bless you, everyone. Anyway, it's uh, it's it's getting towards that time when we all turn back into pumpkins, and so and so we, we really must uh, we really must leave you. To whatever you are doing while you are listening to us, painting usually. Uh, and, yes. So it le- it, only, it only leaves me to, to say thank you for joining us thank you to uh, the bard of the party you're welcome how was the gig by the way the gig went really well actually um, uh, we uh, we blew the roof off the place excellent stuff I nice. got got two more believes the following day on the strength of it so can't be bad good stuff so uh, what out to him can't argue can you indeed so, so yes 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 we have a real bard yes I can't attest to your healing powers but uh, but then you can't attest to the quality of the games I run either, so... Ooh! <laughs> Let it go, Mike. Let it go. I'm, I'm done. I just wanted one episode's worth. <laughs> Don't hold me back anymore. <laughs> Let it go. And at this point, Neil's gone. I was just waiting for Mr. Whitaker to, to, uh, yeah, to break into some sort of Disney sing along. Uh, I'm a bard, not a comedian. Uh, <laughs> indeed. And uh, thank you to our resident wizard. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Hobbs. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Meeps. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everybody. Yes, contributions to the poor for Mr. Hobbs as obviously he's emptied his wallet once again this month. <laughs> 
voluntarily, a short month. apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so when did you say it was a short month? It was a short month. I, I, thought, I thought if you went for you, it was a short month. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. Sorry. Really, you really have no so. position to talk there, are you, Neil? <laughs> the tallest dwarf in Christendom. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> But that not the fattest. Good night from the party dwarf. <laughs> yes. yes, and good night. For, yes, good night from the party dwarf. <laughs> Show, to sort out some treasure shit about rules before we go much further. Indeed. Show me the door. It's over there. Uh, yes. Yes. Ooh. That was your cue for another naff sound effect. <laughs> what me walking? Have you got any more? Sound what me what? Yeah, to, 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 to... Well, I can do me walking into a door. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst holding symbols. <laughs> that's that's before the game be shield afterwards. <laughs> Cut your tail. Yes, and on that note. Indeed. Here I do the musical stings around here, Sonny Jim. <laughs> <laughs> do one of those in C minor, please, yeah. Mike. Yeah. yeah, thinking yes, thinking about it, it, it yes, it would be really funny if we, uh, uh, if we could find somebody to do caricatures of us as a uh, 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 yeah as an adventuring party. That would be really fun. Would Luffy be a barbarian as opposed to a cleric? He certainly. T- no, he's a cleric. Yeah, I suppose he's a cleric. I thought he's a. Mo- I thought he's a monk. <laughs> On that note, uh, let's get out of here, everyone. Thank oh, you. Bye bye. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Happy gaming. Roll good dice. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, why not share it with others by leaving us a review on iTunes? And if you have any comments or questions, you can always email the show. The address is info at meeplesandminiatures co.uk and you can also visit our webpage where you'll find a complete episode archive all the view from the veranda podcasts rules reviews and our blog of hobby items and news which is updated several times a week this is also where you'll find the links to our presence on social media and here you can follow us on twitter or join our facebook group and finally here you can also find details should you wish to support us by making a donation to the podcast. All this on the Meeples and Miniatures website, www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 unported license. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye.